So usually Brian stops dancing when the countdown goes away, but not today, ladies and gentlemen. Built bar. <laughs> so seriously, we're going to have a great show today. Yes. But I have been running around with like a like a chicken my head cut off all day, starving. So I was like, let me grab a built bar. This is the yep. Cherry Barcia. Smart. And so forgive me, but these are really good. I'm telling you, <laughs> I love these things. It's a nice, quick energy boost for me because it's a protein. So it kind of fills me up a little bit. So for the next... I mean, the way our shows go, the next three hours, I'm going to be kind of busy. Yeah. <laughs> I needed something in my system. <laughs> so, uh, so there's a built Bar. And if you want to try one or if you like built Bars, you can get 10% off your entire discount by clicking on the link below. But today, Vince, we got a lot of stuff going on, man. Yes, we do. We, we are going to talk about do. the five biggest questions we have about the Notre Dame football team. We wanted to throw a question out to all of you. If you want us to address the, the Notre Dame announcement if you haven't heard notre dame just announced that their first opening game against toledo will be home exclusively game. right yeah. first home game against toledo will be aired exclusively on the peacock network now not the free version of it like we had in the spring but the premium version so you have to be a subscriber to get it now in the story at the you'll find it at irishbreakdown.com if you're a member of certain already you know services like uh, vince you know vince has access to it already because uh, through xfinity there are some some deals there. They're also going to be doing a um, a special starting August 11th, to, running up to the game, where you can get a discount is what the release said. But I know there's a lot of people real fired up about this. I have an opinion on it. Vince has an opinion on it. So if you guys want us to talk about it, let us know. And then when we complete the podcast portion of today's show, so the five questions, we'll dive into that. Also, SI All-American just released their SI99, the first installment of that. We wrapped that up last night, and uh, that's ready to go. So Notre Dame had, I believe, four commitments in the SI-99. Good chance they may add a couple of those to that list here as we dive into the week. So uh, a lot to talk about. And, of course, tonight at 5 o'clock, we will go live again with a second show to carry and cover uh, Tobias Merriweather's announcement. So we got a lot going on. So Really, the only, let, the only let us... question – go ahead. No, go ahead, Vince. I was going to say the only question yeah. right now – is how much time in between the end of this show and the beginning of that show. Enough time for me to get a little bit of something in my stomach <laughs> and prepare for that show. Right. So, exactly. If you see me typing at the end of the show, it's because I'm getting the next one ready <laughs> to launch right. as soon as we get done. But Right, right. So right. apologies for eating at the beginning of the show, but Vince, um, it happens. just man. a lot going on. So let's, yeah, let's dive it, right into these five questions. Let's do it. Yeah, I'm excited about this because and and originally I, I I'm, gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull the curtain back here a little bit too, Brian. Originally it was our five concerns coming into the season, and th that's not how we really wanted to frame this episode um, mm -hmm. because you and I are very high on this team and and what this team can potentially be, and so concerns just didn't really feel right. You know what I mean? It, it just didn't feel and and frankly. I was having a hard time coming up with five quote unquote concerns that I had. Now, do I have questions about this team? Absolutely. I have questions about this team. We always have questions about this team going into fall camp, you know, whether it's a position battle, whether it's, you know, new guys, whether it's new coaches, whatever the case may be, there's always questions going into the season. And so that's how we're framing this episode. It's our questions, our biggest questions. Could you label some of them as concerns? Yeah, you probably could. Uh, but personally, I was having a hard time coming up with five concerns that I had, con uh, you know, about this 21 team. So uh, these are the five questions that we have. And, and we're going to start off this one with uh, position groups. Right. And uh, there's there's a, a few position groups that, that we want to talk about. Number one should be no surprise to anyone. We're going to start off on the offensive side of the ball and we're going to start off with the offensive line. I, I'm going to say that this group. While there are questions, because frankly, we don't even know who the five starters are going to be 100% at this point, uh, but there's a true freshman involved, there's a transfer student involved, there's position changes potentially you know, involved. So there's a lot of question marks concerning this O-line. I will say I'm more confident in the O-line as we've kind of progressed through the summer than I was maybe two or three months ago, um, but it's still a question mark, and for the reasons that we're going to outline, there, there's a lot of questions about this particular group, how they're going to end up performing together, you know, et cetera. But offensive lines are number one, Brian. 
Yeah, and, and I think this was the epi- this position was the epitome of why we didn't want to go with concern and go with question because I don't know if I would say that I can I can look at the offensive line and, and decide whether it's a concern or a question. It's it's literally just a, such an unknown. Mm-hmm. We don't know who the five stars are going to be. We still tech. I mean, I'm confident in our in, in the info that we got that Jarrett Patterson is going to be at center, but that may change tomorrow. <laughs> that may change two weeks from now. Right. I, I we think that Zeke Crow is going to get a chance to start at guard, but he's going to have to battle John Dirksen, Rocco Spindler. You know, we think Kane Man's going to start, but what if he doesn't perform? I mean, there's so many questions. You know, Blake Fisher looked great in the spring. Is he going to look great? Uh, in the fall, I mean, there's just there's just so many things going on that that it it it's a question mark, and it's an important question mark because it's going to have an impact on how good this team could be. Now, one thing that I think is one of the biggest mistakes the national media has made this season is trying to to say the big step back for Notre Dame is going to be because of the play of the offensive line. The one thing that I'll say that w- w- we saw it in 2018 with Chip Long. I think Tommy Reese is going to do the same thing in 2021. Chip Long designed that a system in 2021 that had reverses, screens, a lot of quick game RPOs that was designed to neutralize the fact that he knew his offensive line was going to be as good. Right. And so that's why we saw Ian Book complete 70% of his passes in the regular season. And so it, Notre Dame's offensive line 2018 was, was okay, right? It's 2019 offensive line was not good. But the system was uh, was because again, 2018 they lost Quentin Nelson, they lost Mike McGlinchey. Sure, Alex Ars got hurt in September. Notre Dame still went 12 and 0. So I do think there's this thought that you know Notre Dame's got this great offensive line, but nothing else. And I think that's one of the things that is a mistake. But I will say this: if Notre Dame is Notre Dame is it could be 10 and 2 if the offensive line plays mediocre, it, it just can because of the way college football is nowadays. And, and you can, as we as I've said all summer, you can scheme to protect your offensive line mm-hmm. if it's not great. Right. Having said that, if Notre Dame wants to compete for national championship, however, then the offensive line is going to have to be better than just okay. It's going to have to be pretty good. Doesn't have to be elite. Doesn't even have to be. As, it doesn't have to be as good as 2017. I, I don't even know if it necessarily has to be as good as last year, but it needs to at least be close, right? And that's what we don't know. And it doesn't have to be that way by September 5th. It doesn't <laughs> have to be that way necessarily by September 18th. But by the time you get to Wisconsin, Cincinnati, sure. game four or five, you know, yeah. they have to be playing well. And then, of course, you get into October, November, they have to continue to get better and better. And so those are the things that that I look at and say, that's why this line is a question mark, because we just don't know on, on the scale of, you know, the 2019 offensive line, which was the worst of this of this post 2016 turnover right to the 2020 or 2017 and 2020 offensive lines which were the two best where will this line fall that's such a huge question mark whereas like at receiver i feel like the 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 floors at least are going to be good like pretty good and and the ceiling is really good you know depending on kevin austin and Braden Lindsay, things that we talked about in and last on the show on monday but with the offensive line i could see it being really good but I could also see it being below average, mm-hmm. uh, and and there's there's it's not just about the five players, but we're gonna find out in 2021 what impact Chris Watt had on the offensive line. We're gonna find that out real quick. We're gonna find out uh, real early in the season if Kane Madden is is a guy that can play at the Power Five level at the, the to the same degree that he played uh, at, at the at the uh, you know at the conference usa or whatever level that was we're gonna find (laughs) out you know how good he is we're gonna find out if blake fisher's ready to handle a full season right i mean it's high school look great in practice yeah it's nothing to go 70 snaps every saturday so i mean again i'm i think he's gonna do it i'm confident his ability to do it but it's still an unknown until he actually does it can josh lug stay healthy can zeke Carell stay healthy I mean, there's a lot that goes – there's a lot of question marks, and that's the thing that makes me a little bit nervous about this group, Vince, is the more you start talking about ifs, the more you kind of get that concern. Well, no, you're absolutely right. And, and you know, you can add Rocco Spindler into there, you know, as another new freshman who who we hope is going to get some time and, and what he looks like and what he's going to bring to the table. They're just – again, we're not saying that it's a huge concern yet, but – Talk to me after game one, and I'll let you know if it's still a, if it's a concern. I, that honestly, that's how I feel because I think we're going to get a lot of information about this offensive line after game one. 
Uh, mm -hmm. But re regardless, it's going to be a question mark for me all the way up until game one. I mean, it, it just is because offensive lines, you need to see them in game action. You need to see them gelling together. You need to see the communication. You need to see all of that. And look, there's going to be mistakes. I, I promise you that there's going to be mistakes, right? You, again, true freshman on, on one side. You've got, you know, Lug, who has five starts at right tackle. You've got Kane Madden, who's never been in an Irish uniform before. You know, the, the, only, the only known that we have is Jarrett Patterson at center. Right. And we just heard not that long ago that he's staying at center. Right. So there's now, just the good news is, is it's not like he spent the whole spring practicing at guard and now he's got to go back to center. He was out. He was I mean, so, yeah. Right. So, I mean, I don't think he's really done much other than center since he came back. Is From a physical standpoint. I'm sure he was From mentally preparing and right. all of that, which is which fine. Which is fine. You can turn that. You can flip that switch quickly. It's and, when and you start training your muscle memory. Anyway. Right. When you start training your muscle memory to do something different, that's when it becomes a bit more of a concern for me. Correct. Yeah, I completely agree with that. So, look, offensive line's a question mark. I mean, it just is. And, again, I to kind of echo what you were saying, but to expound on it, when you read all these national writers, when you when you look at the uh, the opposing coaches' box – when they talk about Notre Dame in, in the magazines and things, they immediately go to the offensive. Oh, they lost four out of five starters. They're 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 clearly going to take a step back, right? You know all this stuff, and then of course if they, they still run back. the same offense they ran last year, back. that's a hundred percent true. Exactly, and it's hundred percent true. And that's where, in my opinion, and I, I think Brian holds the same opinion, is where the national writers <clears throat> just aren't informed enough. They haven't taken a deep enough dive into what Notre Dame is and what they could be this mm -hmm. year to really give a good explanation. And, right. and that's why the, the win total is sitting eight and a half. That's why, you know, all these different things. It's why all these, the clickbait, you know, yeah. Colin Cowherd, you know, Notre Dame's going to lose to Toledo. It, Did he really say that? Offensive line. Did he really I, say that? I heard him. I heard that he said it. I did okay. not actually hear I, I, it. Out of, yeah, because you know, I, I don't listen to Colin Cowherd. So I've heard either. people say it, but I, I also have experienced something this week where People can take something you didn't say <laughs> and turn it into something <laughs> you did say. True. That is true. So I just wanted to be sure about that. But that is it, true. You know the thing. The thing about it is, Vince, that if if Notre Dame does try to still be the same offense they were last year, this will this will be a problem area. Sure, no question. I just think Tommy Reese is a lot smarter than that. I, I mean, mean um, and until he proves me otherwise, I'm I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. And and, and we saw it in the spring. Right. And we saw some of that in the spring. Now there are going to be have to be some things that, that look. They're just the biggest thing now is they're going to have to get really good in pass pro. I can live with them being okay in the run game because you have really good backs and there's some things you can do. But they have to at least be good in pass pro. Yeah, because that was the area in the spring that was really problematic. Like you, can, I mean, there's there's only so much you can do to game plan against a bad pass protection. Sure. And, and what I'm, you know, it's like. You got to move the pocket and all, but that takes away a lot of what you want to do schematically. If if they can only be good at one, if they can be really good at one and just kind of okay at the other in this era, I, you, yeah, I think you have to be good at pass pro and just okay at run game because there's things you can do schematically to get the run game going. If you can't protect the quarterback, you, you're in trouble. Yeah. And that hurts your pass game. That hurts your run game. That hurts all of it. Right. And so those are the things where you can do some RPOs and you can do some misdirections. You can do some spread stuff. You can go 13 personnel. There's all types of things you can do to improve your run game if your offensive line is not playing at a high level. And, you know, so so that's one thing is that the pass pro is going to have to get a lot better than what it was in the spring. And I'm not just referring to the blue gold game because the starting offensive line wasn't together. There was no Jerry right. Patterson. You know, <clears throat> you had Josh Lug and Tosh Baker together. But I mean, you, you look at it, Vince, and, and it wasn't just that game. I mean, we heard about it all spring that right. the offensive line just couldn't block the defensive line. So either the defensive line is going to be a phenomenal, a phenomenal pass rushing group, or the offensive line is, is pretty good. Yeah, and and, yeah. and I guess my my and I, I I hesitate to use this this word, but my concern is with, with the run game and the aggressive nature of what we believe a run game should look like from the offensive line and mm -hmm. what it's looked like under Coach Quinn in the past uh, when when uh, Coach Watt was not on the staff. And when you're running RPOs, which we feel like is going to be a big part of what this offense is, mm -hmm. the offensive line is, is blocking for the run game. Right. You know what I mean? Like, they're blocking for the run game. They're not pass pro. And right. so that concerns me a little bit, you know. Um, and, and again – 
I'm going to have to see it, right? And and I'm hoping that... What's your concern, that, Vince? I didn't... I, 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 I Just, if they're not great in, in the run game, like, mm -hmm. you know, run game blocking, exploding mm -hmm. out, doing those different right. things, RPOs are all about... It, they're blocking the run. They're not pass proing in RPOs, right? right? right. So they're going to be doing a lot more run blocking, right. in my opinion, with the RPO system and that. And if they're not good at it, now that hurts the RPO game potentially. Yeah, but see, I, I don't, I don't think it does. I, I get where you're coming from, and it's a okay. good thought. But here's just the reason I don't okay. necessarily agree with it. And and again, this part of this is going to be the schemes that you're using in it. I don't think North Carolina's run blocking situation last year was phenomenal. It was good, but it wasn't two thousand yard running backs good. What the RPO is going to do, it's going to force you. If again, the RPOs by themselves don't scare defenses. It's when you're throwing RPOs to Braden Lindsay and Lawrence Keys and Avery Davis and Kevin Austin and Michael Mayer that it scares people, right? Uh, Xavier Watts, Lorenzo Style, right? I don't want to leave anybody out, okay? Because <laughs> when I leave people out, people assume, what, you didn't mention uh, yeah. so and so. Is he gone? Right. Hey, he's not uh, even on the roster anymore. Right. So, <laughs> see, there you go. All right. So, so. When you do an RPO to that, what it does is, is it forces them to decide either. So if you're if you're less concerned about the run game because Notre Dame's not great at run blocking, then you're going to be more prone to playing the RPO, which I then think helps the run game because it removes numbers. And and with the backs that Notre Dame has, I mean, look if if the backside guard gets beat and Kyron Williams is in the backfield or Chris Tyree's in the backfield, both have shown, especially Kyron has shown, they can make that one guy miss. And if the next guy is out there trying to defend the bubble screen, that's how you can still rip a big sure. play, right? I mean, sure. even last year we saw that at times where the Florida State game, I mean, one of Kyron Williams' biggest runs was a play where a guy came screaming off the edge unblocked. Kyron made a miss and, and went right. and ripped off a big play. So I, I think it protects the run game by helping them with numbers. And then now it's up to Tommy Reese and Jeff Quinn and Lance Taylor to, and John McNulty, the people involved with the run game, to then say, okay, how can we scheme to protect ourselves a little bit? How can we scheme to say, okay, well, we're not we're not able to block this guy. Okay, well, we may have to do a little, you know, Kane's having Kane Madden's having some trouble, or Z Cross having some trouble with this three technique. So we may have to do our our pin and pull stuff a little bit more this game. So we can get our tackles to help with that kind of stuff. And then we can get mm -hmm. our guards on the move or whatever. You know, maybe we do more zone because we're gonna do more double teams on that three technique where we can get the tackles to help the guard. There's all types of things that you can do schematically to protect your run game as long as you can equalize the numbers with your formations and the RPOs. Sure. And that's why I say the pass game has to be part of that because if because here's the other part how it factors in, Vince, is if you're really good throwing the ball and at least you're good in pass pro, which I think in 2019 they, they were pretty decent in pass pro, even though sure. they were – below yeah. average running the football agree then that agree. puts more of a pressure on the defense of hey they can really throw it and we can't get after them so then you're going to be less aggressive attacking downhill playing the run like they were last year so you're going to see a lot more six-man boxes five-man boxes if the pass game is good which then aids the running it's it's kind sure. of the reverse of what it used to be 10 15 20 years ago where if you could really run the ball it's going to help you with your pass game the way the game has evolved now if you can be really good throwing the football it's going to then aid your run game so that's why I say they at least have to get good at pass pro. And then the run game can kind of come as they get more cohesive, as guys play more together, as they maybe say, hey, look, you're not getting the job done. we got to put somebody else in there. Uh, hopefully they're not struggling because the offensive line coach is teaching the catching thing again. Right. That's, that's, what that's where my concern yeah. originates from, right? I, I think, And I think you understand that. But you, what you say absolutely makes sense. I mean, there, there's ways to scheme around – shortfalls at every position but especially the offensive line there's ways to to scheme around it i, I completely right. agree with you before we move on to the next one vince uh yes. we got a super chat from tommy guns he said brian and vince we might might be time to call an audible on the show we're not going to call an audible on the show we're going we're going to finish it here's what i'm going to ask you all to do so we hear your message loud and clear we're going to talk about the peacock thing we will okay it's yes. interest to you so if y'all could just kind of let's focus on the, the the show for now this part of the show these next four areas and then we will dive right into the Peacock stuff. And then that, that'll just kind of start us into the questions and comments. So we'll kind of make that right. be the focus of the questions and comments. So we'll get to that. So if we could just kind of, because we're there's a lot of comments going on and there's a lot of people ticked <laughs> off about this. I get Understandably it. I get so. It. I get it. So we will do that. But just for the for the next 20, 30 minutes, just let's let's take a deep breath. Let's focus on because this this show's free, right? We're not we're not start charging, you know, we're not gonna this we're this is going to be free, okay? So, uh, so let's get back on track, Vince. Um, yeah, 
Yeah. So our, our second uh, question going into the season, again, is another position group. And it's one that really underperformed last year. And because of that, th- that's why it was on my list, because it so underperformed last year. And that's the buck slash will position. Obviously, we have renamed or we I had nothing to do with it. Uh, Marcus Freeman has renamed that position uh, the the will. Uh, and so but it's the same personnel. OK, so they didn't lose anybody from that spot that everybody was returning. Primarily, we're talking about Shane Simon. We're talking about Maris Luafau, uh and and what that position holds. Right. Because the maybe maybe Prince Collie at some point. Yeah, no, that's a very good point, because I don't think he's got a position yet. I think they're, they were talking about starting him off at Rover, but that's a pretty deep position right now. So I could see him moving over there and potentially seeing the field uh, at that position. So. A lot of question marks coming from that position. We're hearing different things coming out of, of summer and out of spring and, and things of that nature. I don't know that what we're hearing is definitely making me feel confident. And it certainly hasn't answered any of my questions. Um, but after last year, and again, new linebacker coach, new scheme, I get all of that, but it's the same personnel. What is that position going to look like? Right. And I mean, you can start with who's going to start. And then you can go all the way down to how are they going to play? And that's why it's a question mark for me. I I, I do like both players. I do. Uh, I, I think the new scheme will be good for them. But it's kind of a wait and see situation at the Will linebacker position. And can it be productive? And that's if it's anywhere near what it was last year, that's a huge problem. And it and it and it inflates, and we've talked about this in the past, it inflates to other positions right. like the Mike position, because we both feel like that position was kind of trying to you know, make up for the lack of production over at Will, over at Buck, however you want to say it. Um, and so it's kind of a domino effect. And uh, the Will the will linebacker position, which I believe could be, I don't know if I want to say a strength, but it can be a... a, a it, it has the potential to yeah, be a strength. Yeah, th- thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, if you like, if you say you like the two guys that are there, and yeah. I, I don't disagree with you, then yeah, it, it, it can be a strength. It's just about whether or not they get their game where it needs to be. That's the question mark. I mean, yeah. last year, Maris Lewifow played 10 games. Shane Simon played 11. If you take the games that they played together, they combined for 36 tackles in 11 oh. games. That's so incredibly unacceptable. Yes, three. So incredibly it, was that less than three tackles a game? I mean, that's just. It's right at three. It's right at three. Game. Yeah, because there yeah. would be 33. Right. It's just not good. I'm yeah. sorry. I, I, just... I was thinking at first it was it was under three because I'm in the mindset of 13 games. Yeah, right. But uh, obviously it was, it was 12. It's so incredibly unacceptable, and and it's not like teams were avoiding them. I mean, because right. you know that guy Wusu Kormo is on the other side of the field. Right. Uh, it, it was just that they had to involve. That's part of the reason Kyle Hamilton had so many. I mean, Kyle Hamilton had 51 solo tackles in, in 11 games. I mean, that's a lot. That's a lot of tackles, and a big reason for that is is be, is simply because. I mean, put it in perspective. In 13 games in 2011, the year that Manti Teo had 128 tackles, he had 62 solos. That's if you if you add Kyle Hamilton plays two more games because he only played 11 games, he's pretty close to that. Yeah. So Kyle Hamilton had almost as many solo tackles last year uh, on a per game basis as Manti Teo had in a year where he had almost 130 total tackles. Why is that? Because they had to use Sot Kyle to protect the will a Correct. lot. And again, it, it, it's the old mantra, and it's not necessarily true anymore. But if your safety has that many tackles, that's a problem. Yeah, I mean, it, it, in today's era, that's not the same thing because right. you have the court, quarters coverage really changed that a lot. Quarters coverage is essentially essentially a defense that, that was invented. Uh, well, not invented. I'd say reinvent invented because they've always had quarters, but quarters coverage back in, in my day is what you called when it was hail mary time. It was, it was just four twenty. It's like four back. guys getting deep. Yeah. It evolved into. You had the two outside corners sort of playing the post and playing deep, and then the two safeties could get into a deep coverage, but their first steps are actually reading downhill to be able to play the run. It was a way to get extra guys in the box without lining up extra guys in the box. Yeah, And it was designed to kind of help against the spread teams and the read zones and and the perimeter runs and perimeter passes and stuff like that. And so, uh, and it obviously continues to evolve. So that somewhat changed, but when you, but when you look at how Notre Dame had to use Kyle Hamilton last year, People say, well, you know, he didn't make a lot of plays in the pass game. Well, part of that is because, number one, teams didn't necessarily throw at him a whole lot. He did have six pass breakups and one interception, but 
you know, he had more than that the year before as a true freshman. Well, the year before as a true freshman, people were going at him. Right. They were they were challenging him. So he had four interceptions and six pass breakups and you know and fewer snaps. Well, last year they avoided him. And so that but the other reason for it is he had to come downhill and do so much to protect the run game. And you look at it and say, boy, that's 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 fine. You can be good that way, but it, you're going to be even better if you can let if you can use Kyle Hamilton as a weapon, not a protector. Right. If Kyle Hamilton can be used to just play how you want to play him and not be used to protect the rover, the mic, or the will. Now, again, he's going to fit off those because that's part of defense. You know, you're going to run fit off of that. But when you have to schematically do something to have him be part of that, where you have, mm-hmm. hey, we have to protect this guy because we're not comfortable with that boundary run defender, it's it's going to lessen your defense. And Absolutely. so they're going to have to perform better. They have to make more total tackles. They have to make more plays on the ball. They have to make more disruptive plays, that which means tackles for loss. It means sacks. It means getting your hands on footballs, you know, batting down passes, all the, the, the this position needs way, way more disruptive numbers. And I, you know, I think when you look at Clark Lee's defense, we, we did a study on this before, obviously the Cincinnati defense was a lot more disruptive than the Notre Dame defense was last year at the linebacker level. Now, will that, will that translate into a scheme that, that'll do, ask them to do less, you know, reading side to side and more just attacking downhill? We're going to find out. That's a question mark. Yeah. And that's that's why this group is there. And then, like you said, who starts? Yeah. Is it going to be Maris? Is it going to be Shane? Is it going to be a rotation? We're going to find out. Yeah, I think that remains to be seen. Because I, I think – and I don't think I'm overstepping here. We've heard good things about both guys, right? I mean, we heard, we've heard heard we've heard positive things about both guys, which – it's a great spot to be in. I mean, that that's awesome. I would rather have that than the alternative that like, oof, I'm not sure what we're going to do at Will. Yeah. Hopefully this incoming freshman can yeah. take over. Like that's not yeah. a position where regardless of what we think about Prince Collie, that's still not a position that you want to be in. If he starts this year, it's because one of two things happen. A major injury at the Will or those other guys took huge step backs. Right. And that's, again, Prince Collie was my, I believe my number one ranked defensive recruit in the class last year. But these guys are a soft, junior and senior. Who right. are also highly ranked, talented guys, both four star players on my board. If a freshman comes in and beats them out, it means they're not playing well. It, it, I mean, I don't, and you could take any linebacker in the country, I don't care who it is, take the number one linebacker in the country, and I'd say the same thing because that's the talent right. that these two guys have. If they're not in the lineup, it's because they're injured or they're, they're underperforming. And, you know, and so. That's why I'm not talking a whole lot about Prince Collie. I mean, it's fun to talk about freshmen, but if, sure. and, and look, fresh talking about freshmen generates a lot of page views and clicks and all that kind of stuff. But it's also not practical. A team that's going to be as good as Notre Dame isn't going to be playing seven, eight, nine freshmen. At least I hope not, unless we're talking about they're getting a lot of action in the third and fourth quarter, all right? And, and as much as I love Lorenzo Styles, I don't want Lorenzo Styles to be the starter and the go-to guy this year. That's a bad right. sign. Right. As good as I think he is, that that means some other guys aren't playing well or are hurt. Right. And you, you'll occasionally get a situation like Blake Fisher, but Blake Fisher wouldn't be starting right now if there was still a Robert Haynes and a Lee and Meikenberg. At least he wouldn't be starting to tackle. Yeah. Right? It's because there that spot was open. This is not technically an open spot. This is a spot with your top two guys coming back. And it's a battle for those two, and that's right. great. I mean, I'm fine with that. I, the whole iron sharpens iron thing, like I'm, I'm totally cool with that. And, and they're both going to play. I mean, right? Absolutely. I, well, who starts? I think is is irrelevant. I care more about who's in the game in the fourth quarter when, yeah. it, when, when the game when the, in a tight game. That's where Honestly. that's where coaches show their cards. I mean, let's mm-hmm. be honest. You, you put in who you trust when the game's on the line in the fourth quarter. Because uh, sometimes you may have to play a guy who maybe is a little bit more emotionally, un, you know, fragile. Sure. And you know, not starting him might. This is not specific to Shane or Maris. This is just this is the decision you sometimes have to make as a coach. We need that guy checked in. He's going to react more neg- negatively to not starting than the other kid will. So we'll start him. They know they're going to rotate. And then just when we know it's a big moment, we will make sure that <laughs> we'll go with. Yeah, right. We have the kid in the game that we want in the game. Right, exactly. Yeah, it's – and again, I think both of these dudes can play. I, I really do. It just depends on whether the light goes on for, for Shane Simon. He can just play uninhibited and just go. And whether, you know, Maris Lufau can play under control. Right. Because mm-hmm. he is the classic example of plays like his hair's on fire 100 percent all the time, just not necessarily <laughs> going in the right direction. Right. He right. has to have he has to have a rudder. 
And it, it sounds like he's got a bit of a rudder this year, which is great. Um, and, and Shane Simon sounds like he's doing well too. So yeah. I, I'm confident in these guys, but it's still a question mark. Confident in their that. potential. Yeah, that's that's as far as I can yeah. go right now. Yeah, yeah. I'm absolutely. confident in their potential. And yes, we're hearing great things about summer workouts and all that. But sure. as you know, with at this position especially, it's about what you're doing. The pads are on and. I'll say this. I will not be shocked if Marist eventually becomes the guy at will, even if he's not starting. I guarantee you, if he is the guy, they may still start Shane. But what we're going to see is we're going to see scenarios in which they say, okay, he's our starter. But Mm -hmm. Marist at the end of every game is getting more snaps. I could see that. Mm -hmm. Uh, Or he could just start one, one of the two. But I, I don't think I wouldn't be surprised if, if based on what we're hearing, if Marist, Sees, seizes hold of that job sooner rather than later. And if it does, if that doesn't happen, based on what I'm hearing about Marist, it means the light finally went on for Shane, which is going to be great for this defense. Right. Because again, the physical tools are there for Shane. There's there's no doubt about that. It's just whether yeah. or not he can play with the the free the freedom, the looseness, whatever adjective you want to use. To he's just playing downhill, playing aggressively, and playing, being decisive and making plays. Physical tools are there. He just has to learn to do it. And so far, I mean, he hasn't done it really at all. So that's the will linebacker. That's what we are. That is one of our question marks uh, going into this year. I'm going to write down the time here. Sorry about that. Okay. Our next question. And this one I don't think should come as a big surprise to anybody uh, about this position group. And it's not because we don't love the talent that is. Some of it. Some Okay. You, fair you, enough. More, so, you more so than me. And, that, and that's fair. That's fair. Uh, it's not because I don't love the talent uh, that is at this position, uh, but there's still question marks because there's so little returning production, so little returning starts, um, and that's that, that's the cornerback position. Mm-hmm. Uh, cornerback, now, uh, yeah. Corner, I'm not sure yes. people understand corner. this because I think a lot of people are expecting for us to talk about quarterbacks. <laughs> hey, they want to hear us talk about quarterbacks. If you didn't listen to Monday's show, then we're, you yeah. know we're not talking. I was going to kind of joke in this show and say well, one of our questions is who's going to start at quarterback. You know, kind of be funny with it, but no, decided not to. Do <laughs> yeah, exactly. I corner is is a position where, of course, you've got Clarence Lewis who has some returning starts. You've got Tariq Bracy that has returning starts, but Tariq Bracy got benched last year, and and we're hearing wonderful things about Tariq Bracy. We are, mm-hmm. but he still has to prove it on the field that right. he's that he's back, right? right. That he's, that and and he's honestly, back. Vince, can I can I can I just yeah. you mind if I cut you off there real quick? Because I want to I want to add a little something to that. Yeah. I would not only say that not only does he have to prove that he he can do it, but I if he comes out the first two games and three games and he's lighting the world on fire, I'm still going to be nervous yeah. because I want to see how he responds the first time he gets burned. And it's going to happen, right? Every great corner. I mean, Julian Love, go look at the first game against Michigan. Remember who got beat on that big, long touchdown pass to Nico Collins? It wasn't Troy Pride. It wasn't Tariq Bracey. It was Julian Love. Only went on to be a consensus All American, right? It's, right. You're going to get beat sometimes. How does he respond to that? That's the only time we're going to really know if Tariq is ready to be a force for this team. The whole so we year. need to see him get beat, and then how we he see him get beat, to and it. then how 100. Yeah. percent And yeah. it doesn't have to get beat for a 80 yard touchdown. I'm not talking about that. Yeah, you know, get beat on a back shoulder throw. Get a guy beat you on a post route and just outplays you like we saw in the past. It's got you know something like that. That's sure. that's getting beat. Miss a tackle in space. Guy runs for 25 yards. Right. Those are those are mistakes that every cornerback makes from time mm-hmm. to time. You want to limit those mistakes, obviously. But how are you going to be in regards to how do you bounce back from that? That's going to be the true test for treat racing. Now, if he goes 12 games and doesn't get beat. OK, OK, <laughs> OK, sure. Sign me up. <laughs> but that's every not realistic. Corner, every corner gets that's beat. not real. I mean, let, let's be honest. Every corner gets beat with whether it, I'm, I'm Revis Island, you know, all, right. all these different they get beat. I mean, it happens. Right. They're human. I mean, it's a guy makes a great play, whatever. It, it, it's mm-hmm. going to happen. So everybody just prepare yourself for right. that to happen. I, I'm with Brian. In the first he time he gets games. beat or makes a mistake, don't be like, oh, he sucks. Get him off the field. That Don't right. be like that. See it's how he happen. responds to that. And a perfect example is your guy, Cam Hart. And and I'm giving you that credit because I know you're all about it. You know I love Cam Hart too, but you're you're all you're all aboard that that train, and I'm 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 with you. I'm mm-hmm. I'm like sprinting behind trying to catch up. Like let me on, you know. Uh, but what happened on the first play of the game in the blue gold game? Beat. Cam got beat. Yeah, 
what did he do the rest of the blue goal game? Didn't Played pissed beat. off and just dominated. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, right. you know what I mean? Like, beat. you ain't doing that again. Right. And, and you know, he was in position. He just didn't finish off the play. But then you look at the rest of the game. The kid played really, really well. That showed me something. I was actually happier that he got beat on that first play than I than I would have been if they wouldn't have really tested him. Because, like, okay, we got to see how he had bounces back in front of a crowd. It wasn't a huge crowd, but there were people there. So it was on TV. Yeah. It, was a, it was a game. And you say, yeah. how is he going to respond? Sure. And he responded. And he responded very, very well. And he responded with some uh, anger. Mm-hmm. I don't want a guy playing frustrated. I don't mind a guy playing angry as long as right. that it's a controlled rage. Yes. I, that's a word I like to use in football, controlled rage. I think the best players play. I think Manti played with a controlled rage. I think Jalen Smith played with a controlled rage. I think all the best defensive players and some offensive players Quentin Nelson, would you say that's a pretty good way to describe how Quentin Nelson plays, right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure he's got um, a controlled rage right now that he's not on the practice. Oh, team. I know. No, that's <laughs> probably not controlled. Yeah. No one Q. Not <laughs> yeah, playing. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, so I mean, to me, that's where that, that's what you want to see. You want to see that 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 edge. We saw yeah. that from Cam. We've got to see that from Tariq. That's and, what excites me about Cam, just saying. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. we well, we can kind of transition to that, but but we do need to see Tariq get beat yeah. and how does he respond but, right well because i've i've said this we've had sources tell us that is the most that guy has more nfl talent than anybody we have right now mm-hmm. from speed athleticism as far nfl cover talent now there's some other guys that do other things better Tariq's never going to be a you know the the run stopper that julian love was or that you know dante vaughn could have been or you know what i mean if he was i mean you, you know what I mean? Like Nick McLeod was a pretty decent run defender against everyone not named Alabama. So, you know, th- those kind of things, that's never going to be Tariq. He's a cover guy. Yeah. And that's what, the, when they talk about his NFL talent, that's it. It's that it's ability to just cover people. We got to see him. We got to see him do it on a consistent basis. And that's what, well, yeah. And, 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 and having him be who we think he can be just makes this group that much stronger mm-hmm. because now, now you've got three frontline guys and you can allow some of those younger guys to come along. Right. I mean, look, they, they make, you know, a Philip Riley, uh, a Ramon Henderson, whoever you want to say it is that next level guy, right. In the, in the depth chart, it allows those guys to come along. I, I'm not, I don't know how enthusiastic I would be if, if one of those guys has to start necessarily, uh, you know, early on. Now they may prove me wrong, and that's fine. But I still like the veterans to step up. I, I like the guys that are that are that we are expecting to step up, to step up, because it allows those guys to develop. Um, I think you have a different opinion on that than I do. Well, as far I, as- my, it's just it's just from the standpoint of I only want young guys to start if they're the best guy. I mean, if a young sure. guy comes out and just beats you out, then play the young guy. Sure. I, I think where, where you and I would agree is if – and I feel like this is where you're coming from. It's more of a – I don't want to play the young guy because the older guy's not playing well and it's Bingo. time to go. That's, that's different than, hey – you know, Clarence Lewis played really well this spring, or Tariq played really well in fall camp. But man, Ramon Henderson or Ryan Barnes or Philip Riley or Chance Tucker or whoever, just man, he was just too good for us not to play. That's happened right. before. You get beat out, you get right. beat out. That's yeah, I'm fine with that. Right. I'm it's fine more of that. a why are you playing this guy? Because so and so, you know, because like you don't want to play Clarence Lewis last year because Tariq Bracey had a bit of a meltdown. That's not sure. when that's not why you want to put Clarence Lewis right. in the starting lineup. You want to put him in the starting lineup because he just he played better than the other guys. Exactly, and he did, yeah. but he did because Tariq had the, the you know the mental. He would, I mean, if, if Tariq Bracey didn't have the the mental issue that, that he had, and and he had some physical. I mean, he, he got sick, and you know he had he had COVID sure. and all this. You know, and he missed a couple games. I mean, there was a lot of things that went on last year with Tariq, and that's why I'm a little bit less hard on him, is because last year was such right. a weird year yeah. for so many kids, and especially a kid like him who missed. He missed two different games with an illness, and it was different illnesses both right. times. Right. You know, well, he's already a small kid who's battling back from illnesses. You don't just – like, you don't get the flu one weekend and then come back on Tuesday and you're 100% and you're ready to go. I mean, it takes right. some getting your – building your body back up, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, at least that's how it's been. I've maybe gotten the flu a couple times in my whole life. But, like, I, I used to get bronchitis every summer or every winter. And, man, it would just wear me out. And after sure. I finally kicked it for a couple of days, I was still dragging. Well – this is a kid who has who's dependent on being in peak physical condition to be successful. So, you know, there's a lot of things that went into it. That's why I'm just not as hard on Tariq as I might otherwise have been if it was Nick McLeod that played that poorly or, or had struggles or, you know, some other guys. So he's going to be a, a, an important part of this, no question about it. 
and you know, you look at the cornerback position and a guy that you're super high on, Vince Cam Hart, he still has a lot to prove. Oh, absolutely. He did want the blue goal, and he still has a lot to prove. Clarence Lewis has a lot to prove. Yeah. And, we need to see him take that next step. Like he he did great for the role that he was thrust into. Right. And and it was always, man, he's playing really good for a freshman. You know, or it, a freshman being it thrust was always into that, the, that was caveat. forced into the lineup. Right? Yeah, exactly. And so we need to see him take that next step for sure. He needs, needs to be, he's really good, period. Not, <laughs> right. not yeah. asterisk or whatever. It, he exactly. just needs to be really good. He's going to have to play a lot better than he did last year. Because, like, again, you, you grade guys on different levels, right? You grade a true freshman who was thrust into the lineup with no spring ball, with no summer, really not much of a summer, all these different situations. He got thrust into a situation, and he handled himself really well. I mean, I, I couldn't be happier with the way Clarence played last year. Mm -hmm. So, But now you're a sophomore. The expectation isn't, okay, good for your age. It's you got to play. Man. you got to be a baller. you got to come out every game and and and, and – Play at a high level, tackle at a high level, cover at a high level, be consistent. Because there's no, well, he's just a sophomore excuses anymore. You got to play. Right. And if Tariq Bracey plays to his potential, Cam's gonna or Clarence is gonna have to really be good because if he wants to be, still be a starter. And so I think that's where you get that healthy competition. And look, I don't think Clarence. I, I, my understanding is Clarence and 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 Tariq and all the corners. No one's going into fall camp like, hey man, you got this one. It's, hey, you may be there now, but Ramon's going to get his shot. Right. Ryan Barnes is going to get his shot. Chance Tucker's going to get his shot. JoJo's going to get his shot, right? Caleb Offord's going to get his shot, right? There's nobody in, in the secondary other than Kyle Hamilton that's got a sec the starting job locked out, right? Agreed. The, the, and, and that's they got to play like that. I actually think that's going to be good for these guys because they're going to be battling from day one. Yes. There's no, hey, we need time to do no. I'm out there day one, first day of practice and in, in, in just a helmet. And I'm like, okay, I got to be locked in because I'm trying to win this job. And if you're not there, you, you're going to find yourself watching. You're going to yeah. find yourself getting as much playing time as I'm going to get on Saturdays this year. And, and, and I like the depth. I mean, and that's, and that's, and to, to kind of echo that point, I, I like the depth at, at corner. It's not like, for example, um, I, I don't want to throw a, a position group under the bus, but it's not like, okay, you've got the guys who we think are going to start. And then the guys behind him is like, man, if they're playing, we are in trouble. It, I, I like the competition that is probably going to take place within this depth chart because there's talent there and there's young guys that, like you said, that they're going to take it if it's if it's if the option is there. Mm -hmm. They are hungry. They are hungry and they're talented. And so you, you have to play locked in every day if you are number one on the depth chart. I won't even yeah. say a starter right now. At the top of the depth chart, going into fall camp. You've got to play locked yeah. in. If, you you're, got if you're in the too deep, you. if you're in yeah. the too deep, you better be ready yeah. to go. And and I'm really looking forward to seeing what Ryan Barnes can do this fall. He sure you know, he got a late start in the spring, missed the first five practices with COVID, really came on towards the end, played great in the blue gold games, having a great summer. I want to see what kind of jump he can make. I want to see if Philip yeah. Riley can make a jump or not. You know, there's a lot of guys at that position that I want to see battle and made the best man win. And, and, you know, we kind of tie this into the next one, which is safety, obviously. We don't need to spend a whole lot of time on that because we talked about it a little bit on Monday after Kyle Hamilton. Other guys got to step up. Yeah. Teams are going to say, hey, look, and, and and Coach Freeman talked about this in the one-on-one -on -one I did with him is, look, teams are going to say, okay, there's 14. Who's over there? Is it three? Is it 12? I don't really care. That's it's not matter. 14. It's We're going to go with that guy. Exactly. Right? It's not right. number six from last year, and it's not number 14, so we're going to go at that guy. Mm -hmm. They're going to get tested a lot, and they have to play well. They mm -hmm. have to play well against tight ends. They have to play well in zone. They have to play well against slot receivers. They have to tackle well in space. They have to play well, too. The concern there is there's not as much of that young talent pushing. However, right. if some of those young players step up in at cornerback, you let, let's just say hypothetically that the safeties other than Kyle Hamilton and aren't playing well in fall camp. Cam's playing great. Tariq Bracey's playing great. Ryan Barnes is balling out. He's just too good not to play. Ramon Henderson makes a big jump. All of a sudden, you look at number 26, and you're like, hmm. Okay. Clarence has got pretty good size for a corner. Good hitter. Experienced, smart. Hey, Clarence, let's, why don't you, why don't we give you a couple snaps today at safety? You know, you know what I mean? And then who, who knows? Yeah. Right? I mean, so – that's how the cornerback position, if it if it's as good as we hope it is now, because I, right. I think Vince, you and I are 
you and I are going to be singing a different tune about cornerback, we think, going into 2022. They, they will not be in this conversation going into 2022. The question is, is how quickly can they show that talent? Right. The faster they do it, that then that could impact the safety position. Which would be if huge those guys don't step up, then yeah. you could see maybe a Clarence Lewis move over there and say, okay, Clarence is going to get his shot to battle there. Right. And it's not that Clarence isn't playing well at corner. It's it's a lot like your offensive line. It's a lot like your receivers. If Clarence Lewis is one of the five best defensive backs, but he's your fourth, third or fourth best corner, guess what? He's a kid that you can find a plate. Clarence Lewis is good enough and versatile enough as a player. He's not a field corner or nothing, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Right. He can play slot. I think he can play safety. So that's the other thing too, Vince, but you cannot move Clarence Lewis. You're not moving Clarence Lewis to safety because he's struggling. If he's struggling, you just – He's just going to not play. He's on the bench, yeah, right. right. It, but if exactly. he's playing well and Tariq's playing well and Ryan Barnes is just too good not to play and, and Chance Tucker or or Caleb Offord yeah. or Ramon Henderson or whoever, you got three or four guys that are just balling and your safeties are getting their butts whooped every day. Hmm. Let me think about this one for a second. Yeah. Well, that that's that's, that's where when we consider. talk about when we talk about these commitments and things of that nature when we're, when we're breaking down recruits, that positional flexibility that this team covets, and this is why that this is why because like right. you said. It's like the offensive line. You want your five best on the field. I want the same thing in the back. And and I forget which commitment it was. One of the cornerbacks that got committed, we were talking about it. And it was, man, if we've got four great corners, you can play four great corners right. in the secondary or five right. great corners. The way that you know, the game is now. The way yes. the game is now. The you way don't have to yeah. be Steve Atwater or Sean Taylor right. to play safety anymore. Right. In, today's football. in fact, those guys may not play. <laughs> yeah, you can get ejected out of every game. You'd be, but they'd be closer to the line of scrimmage. This, this, right. in this no, kind look, of a Sean Taylor in today's game would be a rover or exactly. a linebacker. Exactly. Because yeah, if you I had him in safety, closer. he'd get ejected. I know what you mean. I'm just yeah. I, I'm, I'm adding on to what you're saying. <laughs> I'm not like, no, what? what? No, I'm, I'm adding on to what you're saying. <laughs> right. This is a safety. He'd get ejected from every flipping yes. game because it's yes, targeting. It I, I think I've shared the story before, but there was a couple years ago on his, birth, on his birthday. Because like every year on his birthday, like people put out all these highlights. Remember how great Sean Taylor was. And he was. And I'm watching this clips of Miami, and I'm like, targeting, targeting, <laughs> targeting, targeting. I mean, like every hit was like, yep, he's ejected. He's gone. Yeah, right. You know, I don't necessarily love that about the game. We kind of talked about the targeting rule in the last podcast. But, you know, you put him closer to the line of scrimmage, and that's not happening as much. Right. Because those collisions tend to happen a lot more in the – In space. You know, in space. Right. But uh, – but, but you, Point is, you don't need to be that kind of guy to play safety anymore. I mean, if you can't cover, you can't play safety anymore. I yes. mean, you don't have to be an elite cover guy. You don't have to be able to line up against Braden Lindsay and run with him as a safety. That's not what we're saying. But you need to be able to cover tight ends. You need to be able to cover back slot receivers at times. You need to be able to be rangy off the top. You know, so what you're not going to do is there's this perception. Well, if he can't stick a corner, you move him to safety. Sure, you can do that. But you're still going to stink because if a guy's not, if a guy can't cover a corner, he's not going to be a great cover corner at safety. You know, you're looking for guys can thrive in coverage. And so that's where I say, depending on how things shake out, we could maybe see something like that. Um, I hope that we don't see that, though. I hope yeah. that I hope that the safety step up and perform well. But, the, you know, the, they're you're, you're look, you're you're what today's August 4th in a day where I'm, we're literally tomorrow by tomorrow will be a month away from the opening of the season. You don't have a lot of time. You can't take three weeks to figure it out. If, if, if after 10 practices, you're like, look, we're just not getting what we need from that other safety position. We got to figure it. We got to add some competition to that. Yeah. Who's that going to be? Yeah. And and so hopefully we don't have to get to that point. Right. That That's the thing is hopefully get there. Now, the last two things, Vince, we're going to kind of talk about, you know, those are the first four. This, the fifth one is we're kind of cheating. We're going to kind of talk about a couple, the, the offense and defense. Like bigger picture more, things. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Not position groups. Right? The first one for me of those two events is we, we don't need to spend a lot of time on it because it's it's just I want to see how the offense looks schematically. Yeah. Right. It's not a question from a gee, I'm really nervous. I don't think it's just more of a uh, let's see. Let's see right. what do they do RPOs and if they do how how much are what adjustments are they going to make to their run game? Because one thing they did last year is they adapted their run calls to fit what their offensive linemen did best. Do they do they have an idea of what this offensive line is going to be? Is this going to be more of a, a counter trade team? Is this going to be more of an inside zone team? Is this going to be more of a gap scheme team? Or are they going to still run a lot of the outside zone? So, I mean, again, they did a lot of outside zone last year because they felt that's what their offensive line did best. 
they may not feel that way this year with Kane Madden and some of those other guys that are a bit more lumbering than the guys they had last yeah, year. So they may be word. more of an inside zone team, a you know, pin and pull team where maybe you're you're down blocking with Kane Madden and you're pulling Jarrett Patterson, you know, and then your tackle. So uh, what's it what's it going to be, right? And so good coaches and I and I believe this staff to be good coaches in this regards, they're going to say, "Okay, w- we can't just run the same plays we ran last year because we don't have Liam Meikenberg, we don't have Robert Hainsey, we don't have Aaron Banks, we don't have Tommy Kramer." What do these guys do well? And so what's that going to look like? Yeah. That's an answer I want to find out. Yeah. Uh, so it's not a question from a, gee, I think Tommy's going to call bad games or he's not. It's just more of a, it's the unknown. How much downfield passing are they going to do? How much quick game are they going to do? How much screen, how much screen is going to be involved? How much RPO is going to be a part of what they do? All those things are questions that I have. And again, not concern questions, but just more of a, I'm curious to see the answer to that. And then defensively, it's more about how quickly are they going to adjust to Marcus Freeman's defense. I mean, that's yeah. a, that's we had somebody ask about that in one of our recent Friday yeah. mailbags. And it was a great yeah. question because that is, I mean, I think Marcus Freeman's a great coach. I think there's great talent, but how quickly does that two units come? That two things converge to become one cohesive unit? Is it a week into fall camp? Is it two weeks into fall camp? Is it three weeks into the season? Yeah, we don't know. Right. We don't know. And that's another one of the things. Right. Yeah. Right. So again, they're not negatives. They're not concerns. I'm not, it's not, oh, gee, I think this guy's going to not do a good job. It's just more of a, we haven't seen it yet. So, you know, until we see it, it's going to be, it's going to be a question mark. And that's what makes college football so much fun, Vince, because you have so much turnover every year, whether it's coaching or players and all that stuff. And a lot of times you're going to look like a different team every year to a degree. You're, you're always going to have your basic, here's who we are. Here's our process. But you know, one year you run more outside zone, one year you run more counter, one year you run more blitzes, the next year you don't. I mean, that's what makes it fun. And that's always going to be the question that we're going to have. Sure. You know, one of the questions we're going to have heading into the season. Do you have any any thoughts you well, want to add to that? Yeah, just, just overall, I would say that that's one of the reasons that I enjoy doing what we do uh, is because th- this is – this is exciting. Like th- those, those fall into the category. The last two fall into the category for me of what I'm going to be excited about walking up to the stadium. Uh, or I, I guess the first game's online. Are <laughs> online? Uh, clicking on the TV. Like I, that's what I'm going to be excited to see. What is, what does this team look like on offense? What does this team look like on defense? You know, all things are pointing towards good things up to this point. But we haven't seen it. We haven't seen them against another team. We haven't seen them in competition. Um, you know, even if we get, you know, we have access to some of the fall uh, practices, well, I'm going to see, you know, some stuff, which is great. But I want to see them against another team. I want to see them between the lines. I want to see them in, in a game situation, right? And so those are the things that make this exciting to me. I mean, the NFL teams, they don't change that much year to year, right? And so I, I'm looking forward to seeing because you've got a new defense coordinator. I almost feel like you've got a new offense that they're running to a degree, to a degree. Um, and so what is that going to look like? And and there's a lot of faces that Notre Dame hasn't been counting on offensively uh, up to this point. So what is that going to look like? So those are kind of like the bigger questions. But again, that falls under the category of why I'm excited to watch this team in September. Mm-hmm. I really to be honest with mm-hmm. you, and and why I'm excited to get my eyes on them in August as well, but more so in September. So they're they're fun questions to ask to me. Yeah, it's going to be fun. I mean, and, and that's like I said, that's what we look for at this time of the year. So that's going to do it for this portion of the show. It, before uh, before we move on to the the talk about Peacock and all that, so stay with us. Don't don't bail. But before we do, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and the notification bell, okay? And then check out that. But that are, those are the five. We, we talked about it on Monday. So if you haven't watched that show, check it out. The five areas that we have the most confidence in. And then these are the five question marks. And as we get into fall camp, the faster these questions get answered, the better this in – a, in a positive manner, the better this team is going to be. The longer these questions linger or become more enhanced, the more concerning things are going to be. So that's going to do it for the podcast portion of today's show. Mm -hmm. Now, (laughs) let's dive into this Peacock thing. (laughs) So I want to to clear up a couple things. Yes, okay. The only game as of right now that is only going to be on the Peacock streaming is the Toledo game. Right. Peacock is going to stream all the Notre Dame games. But the other games are also going to be on NBC. Yes. So According to the release yeah. we got today, none of them will be on NBC Sports because that's not a thing anymore. 
Did, they, did it go away? It, it did go away. Now, I don't know if it's officially that. gone completely because they had okay. some things contractually obligated, but it's not. It's going away. Gotcha. Uh, so it won't be a thing that carries Notre Dame football anymore. It, so it, it th- just this game is going to be on the streaming service. The couple things about it, just I'm, I'm, I'm just giving you data. I'm not sharing my opinion yet. <laughs> but uh, you you can buy. It's four ninety nine a month. Or you can, I think, you, I think there's an annual subscription, but you know, there's sure four ninety nine a month for the premium. There's like two different premium types. There's like premium plus, I believe, and then premium, uh, and it will be on the premium, the four ninety nine a month one. Okay. I don't know the tr- the cancel policy. I I will look that up and we'll maybe discuss that later. Uh, I'll try to go through the process of you know signing up. Uh, one of my issues, Vince, is I don't believe. That you can, like, like you, like on YouTube TV, which is the streaming service I use, I can save a game and then go watch it later. I don't believe you can do that with yeah, this. I'm gonna I'm I'm trying sure. to find that out because you use it and you say you don't think you have that ability. So yeah, so I so I have Peacock because I am an Xfinity customer for my internet. You get it for free. So I get it for free. They had this thing called the Sling Box, which is kind of like a Roku box or whatever, you know, the thing you plug into your TV, right? And it connects to your internet and it looks like it's, you know, it's got apps on it and all these different things. And that comes free with Xfinity, uh, or at least the level of Xfinity I have, I suppose. And it came free with Peacock loaded in on it. And we have a pr- free premium subscription on it. Now, I have not watched anything live on Peacock. Um, I did not watch the blue gold game live on Peacock because I had a doubleheader baseball game. Now I will say when I went back, it was there available for me to watch. Um, and so I've watched other things on Peacock, like for example, the, uh, reimagining of say by the bell, like that's on there, you know, things of that nature. So I use it more like a Netflix or, uh, an Amazon or, you know, that kind of thing, Amazon video. Um, so I've never really watched live TV. But if they treat it like they did the blue gold game, it will be there available once the game is over. But how long? That's but for how question. long? I don't know the answer to that. Right. You know what I mean? Uh, right. I don't know if it's going to be archived. I don't know. Um, so that's going to be interesting. But like I said, I have it for free because I have Xfinity Internet. I know mm-hmm. that's not the same for everybody else. Um, and frankly, let's be honest, it's a streaming situation. And... I guess I'm kind of running into my opinion here, um, but it's a streaming situation. So if you don't have good internet in your house, yep. which I get it, I to- I didn't have good internet in my house either until five of my kids and myself all had to do e-learning last year, right. and we had to upgrade because it wasn't able to do you six were people forced to spend money. Otherwise, you wouldn't spend, and that's the 100%. problem that a lot of. No, so let, let's kind of get some some info out to Absolutely. finish this up, right? Because yes. because we're going to share our opinion. Yeah. I just want to make sure we all understand that this is this is not a situation where to watch the entire season right. you have to pay for the streaming service. I don't know if you can sign up and then if it's a monthly thing, I imagine you can cancel at the end of the month. I don't think right. you can cancel two days later and uh, and say and it hey, might be prorated or whatever and right. only spend like seventy five cents on it. Yeah. Right, you're going to have to pay four ninety nine to watch that game. Right. I mean, and they and they did say that there was going to be I, I pulled up the release uh mm-hmm. here. They did say uh beginning I of August eleventh. Yeah, I want to up use into their the words. game. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you can get here a it discount. Is. Prior to the Notre Dame Toledo game, Peacock will offer fans a limited time offer to save on Peacock premium during the football season. Details will become available at peacocktv.com slash Notre Dame on Wednesday, August eleventh. So there's still some questions out there. My guess is that's going to be for the whole season, though, not just for one game. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's probably still going to be more than the four ninety nine. That's mm-hmm. my guess. That's my right. guess. You know, because they don't look. They're not stupid. They, they they know that people are going to say, "I'm just going to sign up for the game, then I'm going to cancel it." Right. I mean, it, they know that's what's going to happen. So they're trying to wean you in to sign up for the whole football season, so that they make right. a little bit more money than they would if some everybody did that, right? I mean, that, right. That, that's how I see this, Brian. Um, maybe don't it's disagree, not that way, but don't disagree. Um, we'll see what that deal. And that's that the whole reason that they're. Is. Let's be honest. That's the whole reason that they're doing this to begin with. Oh, to push up subscriptions. Reason, exactly. Is they're yeah. trying to force people to sign up for Peacock because otherwise people wouldn't do it. Sure. Uh, you know, and and that's really what it's about. I mean, they're doing this because they know all of the people complaining for the most part, 
when it comes down to it, we'll still sign up to be able to watch the game. They'll spend the five bucks to watch. And I get it because they're fans and they love it. And it sucks that they're put in that situation. And, you know, Notre Dame says, hey, we're doing this for the fans. No, because if you were doing it for the fans, you'd carry it on Peacock, but you would do it just like you did the blue gold game and you'd make it free. Right. You're now saying to your Notre Dame fans, the millions and millions of Notre Dame fans who supported you through 30 years of garbage. Well, now you got to pay to watch us play. Yeah. You can't just sit at home and do it. You got to pay to watch us play. Oh, and by the way, because it's now costing you money, we're not going to actually make it cheaper for you to attend a game either. Right. It's still going to be super expensive to come to a game. It's still going to be super expensive to park at a game. Yeah. And if you want to buy food, you may want to get a remortgage on your, you know, refinance yeah. your home. That's true. You know, um, it, so yeah, it, it's kind of BS to be honest with you. In my opinion, it, it's it's a it, it's a it's a frustrating situation, but it's, it's a not money grab. surprising at all. Yeah, it's a money grab, yeah. and we we saw this coming. I remember talking. Oh, when was it? it? It was earlier this year on on the local radio show that 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 I do. We had this topic. You know, what do you think about Notre Dame moving into a streaming situation? Mm-hmm. Um, and and look. I, there was some comments in there about, you know, Notre Dame should move to ESPN and blah, blah, blah. Well, ESPN, you pay to watch ESPN too. Right. And I don't know if people are aware of that, but <laughs> you pay it's to watch cable. You have so to, it's not right. cable, right? Notre Dame has been on NBC, which you can get with a pair of rabbit ears and a TV. Mm-hmm. And that's why it was great. That's why it was great. Right. And, and the PAC 12 is, is yes, they're on Fox, but they're also on ESPN. Right. So you can't watch all those games if you wanted to, you know, it's all about money, guy. There, there's nobody, that, to my knowledge, uh, I know that the the SEC, but that's CBS and ESPN, isn't it, Brian? Um, mm-hmm. You're not going to be able to watch every game if you're an Arkansas fan. Well, um, and ESPN's not, and CBS isn't even with the SEC anymore. They're just ESPN oh, okay. and the SEC Network now. Okay, there you go. Yeah, that's right. I forgot right. about this. I'm living in the old days, right? Um, but yeah, so. Look, Notre Dame was really the only product that you could watch every single game for free. Every single home game left. Yeah. Home game. Good yeah. point. Um, and there, and this is just step one. It's yo, eventually going to get to the point where this is how you get. Yes. Notre- and I don't know if that's going to be in a year, two years, three years, or whatever. But this ultimately is the way that they're going to go. And hopefully, it's a situation where it 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 doesn't become where you. It's every game is. You know, you have to pay for it, but ultimately that's that's where it's going to end up. It, it, it's going to end up there. And as you said, the, the problem with streaming is I understand. See, here's the thing. I understand the desire to have games streamed because more and more people like to watch games on their phone, which I don't understand for the life of me how you'd want to watch a football game on a screen this big or even the screen of an iPad. Like, right, exactly. why are you not wanting to watch it on your TV? I understand sometimes, hey, I'm traveling. I'm, I'm at a wedding. I get that. <laughs> yeah, I, absolutely. That is your only mode. And it, I guess it's a young people thing. I have no idea. Some of you in the chat can explain it to me. But it, it, what frustrates me is it's like, it's one thing to open up other avenues to reach that audience. I'm with that. But now you're telling, you know, my 65, 66 year old dad who doesn't really do the streaming thing. Exactly. Hey, sorry, you now need to do this. And that's my right? issue. That's my major right. issue with and this whole thing. What kind of quality is that going to be? Like, because let's be honest, streaming service, if you like watching it on a TV, it's not good quality. It's not. Yeah. I mean, I watch YouTube TV on my on, at home on my on my TV, and mm-hmm. it's hit or miss. Yeah. It's hit yeah. or miss on how good it's going to be. We were trying to watch The Chosen with my grandmother a couple weeks ago, Vince. And it's like we've watched it three times and it's always good. And then this one time it just it was blurry, it was spotty. Really? It was like, yeah, yeah. it just yeah. you just never know. I mean, because yeah. it's not like internets are all we I mean, I'll be yeah. working at night and all of a sudden, oh, by the way, your internet's down. Oh, wonderful. This is great. So right, I can't do my job. Thanks. Right. Yeah, it's one awesome. Thanks. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, there's so many built-in problems. It's like it's kind of like I understand opening it up to new avenues, but don't shut down others. Exactly. That's my exactly. problem. You're still with NBC. Why, why are you doing that? So I, someday you're gonna, we're gonna have to all be there, right? But hopefully by then, the quality of streaming is better. And, yeah. You know, just like it's better than it was five years ago. But this is a this is a frustrating deal, and you know yeah. now people who are on budgets are gonna have to be forced into decisions to say, hey, you know, and for some people it's not gonna be a big deal, but for others, hey, well, I don't I, really have the ability to do this right now. Yeah, and I and I don't and I don't even know. I mean, five bucks is five bucks. I mean, somebody in the chat yesterday said they'd spend twenty bucks at fast food, no problem, right? But five bucks is different to everybody else. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, to to 
from one guy to the next to another guy, five bucks is different, right? And, mm-hmm. and you really and for some, it's the principle, and that's a very good point. And I, my issue, and you hit on it, is the generation that doesn't watch streaming, right? right. And and that's because my eighty nine year old <sighs> grandmother watches every Notre Dame game. And now you got to figure and, out, how and, to and I had to literally through drive streaming. three hours to her yeah. house to set up YouTube TV on her on because because you, right. you with YouTube TV you can have it connected to multiple places. So I got sure. YouTube TV and I gave my grandma one so she could watch it because you know she's I mean she's eighty nine years old right she's not she doesn't need to be paying exactly. for cable anymore so I exactly. got rid of her cable I hooked, gave her my YouTube TV and then I had to like walk her through the entire way of being able to watch things that I'm recording for her from my house three oh, hours geez. away. Wow. Well, yeah. now I got to figure out how to get her signed up for Peacock. Yeah, exactly. You know, and am I going to be allowed to uh, use my, you know, account for her or does my 89 sure. year old grandmother living off social security now have to pay for the Peacock network? Right. right. Which means she's just not going to watch. Exactly. Right. And that's the so, problem. That right. That's the problem. And, I, and look, and I don't care who the opponent is. I don't care that it's Toledo. This is the first game of the season that's at home. And mm-hmm. a lot of people are going to want to watch and they're not stupid. They know this. They, they know that people are going to do it and they're going to make a lot of money doing it. And, it's unfortunate, and, that, and that's who I feel sorry for, is the people that don't normally stream stuff. Like, for me, it's not a big deal. That's all I do is stream stuff. I, I don't mm-hmm. I don't even have cable or anything anymore, just like you. All I do is stream, so I'm used to it. It's no big deal. It's just I'm right. clicking on a different icon to watch the game. But right. for other people, it's a huge deal. It's a huge deal. My in-laws, I, I don't know. Are they going to be able to watch the game? You know what I mean? Like, right. or am I going to have to do exactly what you just said? So that that's my right. issue. It just felt like a money hungry grab, and it, amidst all the money hungry grabbing that's going right. on right now, I was hoping Notre Dame would kind of stay outside the fold. Why would you bit, think that? I mean, Notre Dame's I, always I, been I that know. way. It's I just, just they weren't doing it from the way that he, that Texas yeah. is doing it. Yeah. Uh, so Br- Brandon just said, uh, if this is a sign of anything, it's that Notre Dame needs to find a new TV company when their NBC contract is up. Tired of them using Indy as their guinea pig. It'll be like that no matter where you go. I, I, I'm partly agree with you on that, but partly not. You know I don't like – I think they do use Notre Dame as their guinea pig. With NBC – it's it's not so much their guinea pig. It's let's take whatever failing part of our business we have and try to use Notre Dame to prop it up. And hook That's up what they the, do with yeah. NBC Sports, sure, right? Sure, sure. Uh, and, and then doing the USA thing and all that. I, I, don't, I don't like that. That, but I understand it because it's a brand because they know that they're going to get Notre Dame sure. fans to watch that and hopefully they stick around. It's like so. So I, I somewhat agree with that. But look, ESPN is going to do the same thing. Oh yeah. You know, if, if they sign with ESPN, for example, you don't think ESPN would start their own Notre Dame network that people have to pay for and they start putting certain things on Blue Gold Game. But again, ESPN you know, is a paid against, network. You got to pay to have ESPN. I'm saying additional. Yeah. Right? right. I mean, so yeah, you've got ESPN, but. You, just because you have ESPN doesn't mean you have the SEC network. Sure. Right? In certain parts of the country, you get the SEC network because it's part of your whatever. If you play for a streaming service like YouTube TV, then you you get it. You know, But you, you're not just paying for you know basic cable, right? Right. So it, it's all part of it. But you, you don't think they're going to do things to try to, to, to milk Notre Dame fans who are some of the most rabid, loyal before you know, in the country? Sure. Uh, Brandon also said go to CBS, and I agree. I would love to see Notre Dame go to e- CBS because I don't like NBC. I don't think the broadcasts are good. But don't think that CBS won't try to do the same thing. Exactly. They're just going to put them on Paramount right. instead of Peacock, Peacock yeah, right? Like just found out that, you know, uh, SEAL Team is going to be on Paramount now and not on CBS. So guess what? I'm not going to watch it. I'm not going to pay for wow, 19 dude. different streaming services. Wow. Yeah, you know what I mean? Throw that dart at me. Okay, right. Cool. So, I mean, okay, fine. I, I don't need it that bad. At some point in time, yeah. if, if this stuff bothers you, at some point in time, you just have to put your foot down and say, I'm not going to watch it. Yeah. But when it comes to football teams, people are going to I'm not going to watch SEAL Team anymore. It stinks. I'm ticked. But I'm not paying whatever, six ninety nine, seventy nine, or whatever just to watch SEAL Team. Because those things all add up. All those streaming yeah. services I'm add already up, paying man. for YouTube, yeah. and that's part of I mean, that's for me, that's for my business. I need YouTube TV to be able to watch all the games I need to watch for my job. So I mean I can justify it that way. But I'm paying for like 50 channels I don't need again, which is right back to where I was, which is why I didn't like cable. Exactly. You know, like exactly. I don't need all these, I mean, there's so many channels on, on YouTube TV. I'm like, why do I need that? And yeah. then they added more channels this spring and ch- jumped it up 15 bucks a month for channels I've never watched before, <laughs> of nor will I watch because that's not why I'm on it. And this is what's going to happen with all these other things. The, so if anything, it's it's because the bundles are not there anymore. It's going to end up being just as expensive, but now you have to pay for each one individually. It's going right. to be the same thing. Right. And that's the frustrating thing about it. But 
but that's what they're all going to. They're going to take popular shows and they're going to use those popular shows to build up their streaming networks to, so they can start kind of keeping all the money to themselves. And if you want to keep watching the show, you got to do it. So Brandon, I get what you're saying. I would love to see Notre Dame go to CBS. I would love to see Notre Dame and CBS uh, work out a deal in 2025 where Notre Dame leaves NBC. That'd be phenomenal for me. But it's still going to, this, this, what we're talking about here is still going to happen. Absolutely. Because it, 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 it will. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I agree. And it's, it's unfortunate, but it's, I don't know. It's the good and the bad of being a Notre Dame fan, I guess, because yeah. they know that we're, you know, crazy fans. And if I didn't already have Peacock, I would probably buy it for that game. I would, yeah. I, I would, I'll say it. I would. Um, and it's unfortunate that that's not, it's not the way I want to do business. Um, but I would, I don't want to miss the game. Either. Right. So. And, and Tommy Gunn says Hulu uh, Hulu Live has all the different conference networks, but again, that's extra money. Like it's an additional my, expense. I, I have Hulu, but I don't have the I don't pay enough in Hulu to get live games. Yeah. I can only get you know the recorded shows. Sure. So it's like it, it's the same thing. Oh well, you, I'm paying for it, but I'm not paying enough for it to get those other things. And af- after a while, it's like I'm already paying for YouTube TV, which I have to have. Again, that's how I have you know. It it just. It's it's getting ridiculous. We got another super uh, chat, Brian. Felix Fournier. Yeah. I became a Notre Dame fan because it's the one team I can watch on a regular basis in Canada. Stuff like this hurts the brand, in my opinion. You're absolutely right. Absolutely. You know, like like it kind of bothered me that Jack Swarbrick used the Lindsey Nelson Sunday replays as an example for Notre Dame's always been outside the box. Here's the huge difference between that because because that's how my dad became a Notre Dame fan. That's how a lot of people became Notre Watching Dame fans. Watching Lindsey Nelson replays, and then of course that's how I indirectly became a Notre Dame fan because I became a fan because my dad was a fan, right. and my dad became a fan because he'd watch the Sunday in, uh, replays on with Lindsey Nelson. Here's the difference: that was on normal TV, that was on exactly. basic TV, which meant it was accessible to everybody that had a television back then. This is not that way. This is not you stumble across the Lindsey Nelson replay on a Sunday and, oh, wow, I'm hooked. Yeah. This is now I have to intentionally go look for this. And I don't think this is building your brand. This is just a, n- a new revenue stream, which, right. you know, I, I'd be, I can live with that if you just say what it is. Don't tell us it's something that it's not. Don't make it seem like we're trying to get access to more and more fans because if that were true, you'd put it on Peacock. But you'd make it part of the free Peacock because you right. there are things you can watch for free on the Peacock network. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I and I I I was annoyed by the fact that the Blue Gold game was on Peacock. I was I was annoyed for the same reason that I'm annoyed now outside of the paying part that it shuts out a whole generation of people who don't do streaming right. Mm-hmm. And, and so I was annoyed by it. Now, as somebody who does streaming. I enjoyed it because I could just go back and there it was. Boom. I can hit it and I can watch it because I couldn't watch it live. It was beneficial to me. But again, I'm very competent when it comes to streaming stuff. But right? you could, yes, you could still, you could do that on YouTube TV. You could do that right. with DVR and right. your normal thing, right? Exactly. So, you know, but now that they've moved it to the premium side, it, it makes it 10 times worse. Right. It just, now, if they were if they were really smart about this, they would do things on the premium on that, that that they don't do on the normal TV. Like they would have certain insights or something Some like that, the which is where it's going to go. I mean, yeah. that's what Fighting Irish TV is going to be. Sure. Hey, you sign up here because let, let, can we be honest about something, Vince? I've been saying this for years to people in the media. You know what I'm about to say. Notre Dame has been moving towards basically them being the the drivers of all the content coming out of Notre Dame. They're, oh, they've absolutely. been moving towards that for years. Absolutely. We're going to, we're going to likely see less and less access. You know, um, they're now treating the, it's like, uh, the, it's like if they letting us go to a game, letting us go to practice is now considered a privilege for us. Mm-hmm. That's how they treat it. Well, we let you, you let us, we're, we cover you. We're the media. Like we we should be allowed to. This isn't a privilege. This is what you're supposed to do. They don't view it like that. Like they don't view it like, hey, they're a, an entity that that's above reproach. They allow us to have a sneak peek and and we can go here and we can see this and we can see that. But you can only do this. You can only do that. You can't write about this. You can't write about that. They tell us what we can and can't do in a lot of mm-hmm. ways. Yeah. And and th- it's only going to get worse because right. as this Fighting Irish TV is, this is where the press conferences are going to be. So the media is going to watch it the same way that the, 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 the that fans do. They're going to control the narrative. They're going to control all the news. They're going to control the flow of information. And I'm sorry, that's not a good thing. 
Mm-mm. That's not a good thing because you think they're going to go in a game like, you know what, our, our coach didn't call a good game today. No. It's, it's going to be the, the Notre Dame hype network is what it's going to be, which sure. is fine for some things. I mean, to watch old games and to watch hype videos. and so, I mean, there's there's a place for that, but there's but also a place for source of information. Yes, exactly. That's called propaganda, by the way. That There you go. I'm just there saying. It's a but that's where it's going. Coming out in me, but that's yeah. where it's going. Yeah. So um, that's the unfortunate thing. But look, if, if people don't like this, there's really one thing you can do. Don't pay for it. Exactly. If you want to send a message to Notre Dame and you and you want to push back on this, don't pay for it. Yep. I, I get it. I'm not gonna. I'm I'm not gonna pay for it. I'm gonna just go to the game. I, it, I'm not gonna be able to cover the game. I'm gonna get a ticket and I'm just gonna go to the game. I'm not yeah. gonna cover. I'm not gonna pay for it. I'm right. gonna pay four ninety nine so I can watch a game that I should, you know, be able to. I mean, I'm already gonna have to pay enough to go buy a ticket to be at the game. You know, I, no, I'm not doing it. But that's my that's just me. That's just me. Right. Everybody's got to make their own decision, right? right. I'm but lucky I, that I, I got it for free because of something I've already right. purchased that I paid. Well, you're money. not getting it for free because as well, soon as right. you cancel your Comcast, you got to pay for it. I mean, you yeah, are paying exactly. for it. It's going to yeah. be built into the cost of Comcast. Oh, 100 percent. I you pay know? too much so, for that as it is. It feels yeah, like. but see, that's what they do. They say it's yeah. free. Well, right. no, it's not because didn't you notice your Comcast went up about five bucks a month <laughs> in the last year? You know what I mean? Right. Like, right. So you're still paying for it. But I mean, yeah. honestly. You, if we want to just complain about it, we can complain about it. We'll go through all the questions and the comments and stuff like that about it. And we can do that. We can have a vent session. But if it's something that you're really against and it's something you want to push back against on, then the only choice you have is to just not pay for it. Right. I mean, and, and I'm and that's fine. And I'm not going to criticize you if you do that. I'm not going to criticize you if you don't do that because I understand the love for your team. I mean, you know, so we're getting to the place now where people got to make tough decisions. What's more important to you? Watching yeah. the game or, you know, protecting your bank account or, you know, putting your foot down and saying enough is enough. I mean, there's all – everyone's going to come at it from a completely different angle, and they're going to yep. have to make their own decisions. I and mean, everybody's lines going to be different. At I mean, the end of the day, yeah. Notre Dame knows that the vast majority of the people, no matter how upset they're going to be, when it comes down to September 10th, they're going to look and say, ah, I got to watch it. I got to watch. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's what's going to happen. So, yep. Vince, you want to go through some of these questions and comments that people have? Because I want to allow shot. people to kind of vent – about this and some of the things we've already addressed we don't need to pull up vent so like the whole thing about it's only going to be on peacock right we we did address that it will be this is the only game that's going to be on on the premium only Only. right the every other game season is going to be on premium i mean on peacock if that's the way you want to watch it but right the other games will also be on nbc so and i don't did they ever officially announce that drew Brees was the color guy before today Yes, they've announced that. Today? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they've announced that. Yeah. Okay. I, I was curious about that. All right. Uh, DJ Wilson, a non-Peacock question. Uh, setting O-line and corner aside, my biggest question is how can they use Williams and Tyree in creative ways, making the offense revolve around that position? I believe these two could be so dynamic that defenses will be forced to game plan for the Irish yeah. backfield. And that's a great comment, DJ. And that kind of ties into what we were talking about at the end of you yes. know what's the offense going to look like. Very good comment, and th- and those th- so when just because it's a question doesn't mean it's a negative. DJ saying this is a big question. His he's not saying I don't think they're going to use the running backs. Right. I don't think they're going to do. It's more of a, I'm curious to see how it's going to go. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And that's kind of how we are on yep. that particular topic too. I'm I'm excited to see what it's going to look like. It's not like hesitation, like oh gee, I don't think they're going to use the backs. Right. It's just more of, okay. How are they going to do it? Let's let's yep. see it. Uh, I'm bringing this up because I want to remind everybody. Uh, Brandon Plensner says I can't wait for. Uh, Tobias Merriweather's commitment tonight, what a duo Merriweather and Williams could be. And he says could be because they have not committed to Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. Uh, But there is a commitment announcement by uh, Tobias Merriweather tonight, and we will have it at 5 o'clock right here on YouTube Live. So make sure you come back and check that out. So we will be live, and we will be discussing whatever decision he makes uh, and how that will affect Notre Dame. uh, Because he said he's going to – it's going to be live on his Instagram so okay. we'll as long as that actually stays true, we'll 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 live stream that his Instagram cool. and we'll we'll go about it that awesome. way. Awesome. So I just want to remind everybody that there will be a second show today, regardless. So that's why I pulled that up. Uh and now we jump into the complaints about Peacock. There's some football questions in there, but yeah, there's a lot of this. There's right. I want to understand sure so. so I'm I'm reading through them because I don't want to miss any. Um Here's here's one I'm going to bring up, just kind of what we were discussing as you're looking, and this is from Fred Benson. It says CBS will not have the SEC after next year. 
once NBC Peacock's rights with Notre Dame are done, have CBS air indie games better yet, a 24-7 Notre Dame channel on free TV. It, it's not going to be free, number one. Notre Dame is not going to do something for free. Mm-mm. Number two, if you go to CBS, it's going to be the same thing. Then it's instead of it being Peacock, it's just going to be Paramount, which is, I believe, the CBS streaming service. Correct, Vince? Yes. Paramount. Mm-hmm. So it's going to be the same thing. Called Paramount Plus, I think. Is yeah, the this is name not an e, yeah. this is not a CBS thing or an NBC thing. This is going to happen. No, ma- yeah. they sign with Fox. It'll be the same deal. I mean, yep. this is going to happen as long as they know that people were going to sign up for it and eventually going to do it. And it's going to make them a ton of money. It's just what's going to happen. Yeah, exactly. And, and yeah, yep. Well, we're 15 minutes into questions, and uh, it's still all about that. Oh, here we go. We can put uh, some of the my, comments up, Vince. I mean, if people have okay. legitimate, like, if they're adding yeah. something to the conversation right, of right, this, right. Then, then go ahead and add those in there. Because I want to, I want people to be able to, to sure. voice their frustrations more so than we normally would do in a Q&A like this, where it's more just about the questions. I'm okay. Just if there's some if there's some comments of, of like, hey, you know what? Like, this is a legitimate complaint that I'm sure, sure. a lot of people are feeling to go ahead and do that. But I'll go and read this while you look for, for some of cool. those. To me, Michael Johnson says to me, Michael, we haven't seen you in a little bit. So I, I hope everything's good, but we're glad to have you back in the show. To me, Ohio State has more issues than Notre Dame. We have a quarterback that has played in college. In, a, in college. They have one, and the line is not as good as Notre Dame. Uh, they, Yeah, to his point, they don't have a single quarterback that's thrown a pass in college. Mm-hmm. CJ Stroud played some mop up duty last year where it's just handing the ball off. And it wasn't often because, you know, Ohio State couldn't afford because of the shortened season. Ohio State couldn't do as much getting young guys in at games because right. they needed as Good much point. work as possible with their their first teams and their regular rotation guys. Good so point. they were leaving Justin Fields in some games. Plus, some of those games they were blowing teams out. Justin wasn't playing, wasn't super sharp. And they had to try to get everybody on the same page because of the way that the offseason was. So C.J. Stroud played a couple games last year, but it was just handing the ball off. Right, right. And he threw zero passes. So it's him, Kyle McCord, who's a true freshman, and now Quinn Ewers, who's a true freshman. So, you know, and and I, I'll somewhat disagree with their off, about their offensive line. They got a lot more coming back on the offensive line. They got Thayer Munford, uh, Nick pettit Frere, you got Harry Miller. They've got some a little bit more proven commodities at that level coming back. If Caden Madden is, is as good as Notre Dame thinks, then then maybe Notre Dame might have a better line. But I'd say right now I have a little bit more confidence that Ohio State's going to have a really good offensive line than I am Notre Dame's just because I've seen most of those yeah. guys play at, at a pretty high level. But the quarterback thing to me – and but this is – what Michael's saying has kind of been my beef for the last month, Vince, which is they're hyping up every single thing that, that Notre Dame doesn't have right. and just dismissing the fact that Clemson I – mean, let's be honest. Is it going to be harder for Clemson to replace Trevor Lawrence or for Notre Dame to replace Ian Book? Can we be honest about that and say it, you know, especially when you consider it's Trevor Lawrence and Travis Etienne and right. their top two receivers right. and their best offensive lineman, but nobody's predicting a drop off from Clemson. And if it is a drop off, it's like, oh, they're going to be fifth, right? I mean, right. Ohio State lost a lot. Alabama lost six first round draft picks from their football team one at running back, one at receiver, one at quarterback. One at offensive line. They would have had two offensive linemen drafted in the first round if Landon Dickerson didn't get hurt. He still went just outside the first round after tearing his knee up. And then, you know, but no one's saying, hey, they're going to take a step back. No, it's just Notre Dame that for right. some reason is just going to take this huge step back because they lost their quarterback who threw 15 touchdowns last year in 12 games, you know? So, um, yeah, they lost yeah. their seventh round draft pick and undrafted draft pick, you know, undrafted guy receiver. So, yeah, they're going to suck this year. <laughs> You know, um, yeah, right. Yeah, it's a little frustrating. Uh, Mark Kramer checking in, guys. Love the show. Thank awesome. you, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate that. Uh, Beer Belly, good question here. If Jared Patterson is the best center in the nation, like we all think, then why flirt around with him to a different position and not let him flourish at his best position? I think because number one, there's an assumption that he wouldn't have flourished where he was going to play, right? I think he would have. I think another reason for it is this is what would have been best for Jarrett to increase his NFL draft profile. Because right now, there's going to be a lot of NFL teams that are going to just look at him and say, well, he's a center. So if you don't need a center, then you're not going to draft him. Some teams may think outside the box that maybe he can play guard. But if Jarrett Patterson would have lined up a tackle this year, that would have increased his NFL draft profile. Ultimately, that's not why you make a decision. That's just a reason. It's a factor in it. 
But the other part is, is just because he is the best center in the nation, and, and I don't – I mean, I, he's still got to prove that he's the best. He's in sure. the conversation of it. But there's some pretty good football players out there. I believe the kid from Iowa, uh, isn't he a center? Tyler, was it Lyndon? Uh, I think so. his last name. I believe he's a center. He's really good. He's in the conversation, though, right? Yeah. But just because he's the best center doesn't mean that your five is going to be the best with him at center. Because what if your fifth best guy or your fourth best guy, your third best guy – is way better at center than he would be at guard or tackle, hypothetically. I don't think that's necessarily the case, but hypothetically, I think there's a legitimate reason. You know, if you think Zeke Carell can play at a high level at center and then Jarrett can play somewhere else, and that's going to help you get, you know, because what's here's some advantages of playing Jarrett Patterson left guard. You put him right next to your pup, Blake Fisher. What kind of, you know, he's going to help him a ton. Whereas and if Kane Madden or Zeke Carell or Rocco Spindler or somebody else is there, they're still learning their deal too. They're not going to be able to, to bring Blake along the way that Jarrett Patterson, who knows what he's doing, right. would be able to do. So there's there's all that type of conversation that goes into it. But again, part of it was just allowing Jarrett to expand his right. basically NFL resume and also be a way that they thought it was – because they weren't – I mean, they couldn't have anticipated that Blake Fisher is going to show up and just seize the left tackle job in three days. No, because right? before he showed up, we were talking about Jarrett Patterson being the left right. tackle. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Right, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So it, it, I'm fine with the, the decisions they made. And and I'm just, I mean, it, you know, I know Vince, it took you a little bit longer to be okay with it, but I, it, well, I'm okay with Jarrett Patterson being a center too. I mean, I don't think it was a right or a wrong answer. It was just what's the best way to get your best five together yeah. to where they can right. play the best as a unit, not just mm -hmm. one guy being great. And then everybody else not really being comfortable where they are. Tyler Dijak says, I was so concerned about wide receiver recruiting but if we get Merriweather and Williams this week, what a turnaround. Merriweather is announcing on the IB channel, question mark. Yes. Well, well no, no, no. But we'll He's have not announcing on yeah. our channel. We Correct. will carry his Instagram feed, which yes. is how he's going to announce. And he's also going right. to be announcing on CBS Sports. So yes, as long as he still has it on. I mean, I could see CBS Sports kind of shutting that Instagram part of it down. Say, hey, don't do that. Only carry it with us. I could see them doing that. If that's the case, then. I don't know if we can stream that live. I, yeah. I, we're still trying to find trying the, to have, the rights yeah, to that. Right. Yeah. But it, we'll, at the very least, we'll be watching it and we'll announce it and let it know, and then we'll dive right into it. So, uh, but uh, yeah. So that's that's what we'll be doing. But it won't be. I want to just make sure that we'll be carrying it. But it's not going to. He's not doing it with us or through us. Is is what I want to make sure that we're we're clear on. But yeah, it would be a great turnaround with receiver recruiting. And and look. We'll have a lot more to say about that tonight, but yes, it would be a huge turnaround if they're able to get Williams and Merriweather. Because when we were hammering Coach Alexander back in February and March, C.J. Williams is one of those guys that they weren't doing a good enough job with. Right. So if they're able to get him on Sunday, again, these are ifs. These are ifs. Yeah. Then that's yeah, that's that's okay. You we hammered you for it. You stepped up and you got it done. Okay, great. That's that's how it mm -hmm. now just don't put yourself behind the eight ball next year like you did this year and you know make these changes be permanent. That would be the right. ideal scenario. Uh, th there's some talk about you know which games people are going to be going to and and somebody said that hey. they're going to be wearing their IB gear. Yeah, and I love that. Did, Tyler he, says I need to snag some gear. Yes, love the white polo that Brian has. You can on. get that. We have our our yeah. the link to our our store is is down below. And also, if you are a a member of the Irish Breakdown message board. If you look at the top bar, there's a link to our to the store, the merch store, right there at the top. You can see that as well. It's in that bar with IB, IB.com, IB Boards, and obviously Vince has his version. I got my version. Right. The Vince, the hat that Vince has on is also available through that. I'm actually going to go buy a hat later today. Uh, one of our customers, Vince, bought that one snapback that's like gray okay. with the navy blue and the logo. And I had some people ask for that, and I, I wasn't sure if I was going to like it, but he sent me a photo of it. When he got it, I'm like, yeah, that's sharp. I gotta have that. <laughs> so that's gonna be so on your head. That's gonna be on my. Love that's it. gonna be. That's gonna be ordered here soon. But Love you can it. find that there. But there was a comment up. Above, so Tyler, that's where you can get the link below. And here's the other thing: if you have not signed up for IrishBreakdown.com, the, the excuse me, uh, the the message board, Irish Breakdown message board, and you also want to do the merch store, do the message board first. Because if you sign up for a monthly subscription, you get 10% off, you'll get a 10% off discount code for the merch store. If you sign up for an annual membership or if you sign up as part of the booster club, I then give you a 20% discount for your next purchase of the of the merch store. So if you're thinking about doing both, if you you're gonna save money if you sign up 
for the message board first. Then, then I, you know, as soon as I get that that same day, I'll send you the 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 merch store discount code. So, so if you're thinking about doing the message board and the st store, do the message board first. You don't have to if you're only going to do the merch store. Then do the merch store. That's cool. But I'm just trying yeah, to help right. you save a little bit of money if you're going to do both. Do it that way, and that way you can save a little bit of money. Did I miss a comment that you wanted? Yeah, me to throw Corey in? D on the ESPN comment. I, I do want to get that up because there's obviously a part part of it. This is oh, part of the frustration go. that people have with with this too. This one, mm -hmm. uh, Corey D says ESPN, which is a joke, had an hour long college football show and spent a grand total of twenty five seconds talking about Notre Dame. It's all about the SEC. It's just stupid. You got to remember, I, and I'm not saying this is a good thing. But who who does who does ESPN pay to have their games on? I mean, yeah. that, this is this is why I have told people yeah. stop listening to ESPN yeah. because ESPN is no longer a news network. Right? They are now a a, a it's now a we because they're they have so much invested in yeah. the SEC. It, it's in their best interest to make the SEC the most important thing in the world. Which means they're going to be pushing for. It's why every year they're pushing for a second SEC team to be in the playoff sure. every single year. Uh, it's just who they are, right? Notre Dame. Why? Why talk about Notre Dame? You ever, you ever notice that they talk more about Notre Dame when Notre Dame's got issues going on than when Notre Dame's supposed to be yeah. pretty good, right? And then when we get into the season and Notre Dame's really good, then they start talking about Notre Dame because they don't have a choice. Yeah, but I mean, they also know that people are going to watch. But listen, right. they are not a real legitimate analysis place anymore. So when they say Notre Dame's got to go undefeated to make the playoff, A, there's zero evidence of it, and that should now be gone because Notre Dame got in last year with a loss. Okay, so can we can we dismiss that finally despite what ESPN says? Okay. Oh, uh, SEC is always going to have two teams. Okay, it's happened once in seven years. So, again, can we please ignore what, the, what ESPN says? They're constantly wrong, but it's not because it, – they're not even wrong. They know what they're doing. It's a, it's a, you know, it's the spin network, right? So that's why I keep telling everybody, stop, stop. I mean, look, go to ESPN to be entertained, right? What's the E stand for, right? It's entertainment now. Yeah. It's like pro wrestling. That's what ESPN has become. They actually talk about wrestling now, which is very fitting. Uh, it's, it's not real life anymore. It, it's, it's agenda driven. It's, it's their narrative because the minute they became so, because here's the other thing too is, they don't they need the the they need those TV deals more than ever now because they're not making money on all the other parts of their show. They're not making money off of you know because people are tuning in for sports center and all that and they're paying these analysts so much flipping money. Like Maria Taylor was asking for like Stephen A. Smith money, which my second next question was why the world is Stephen A. Smith making that money? I mean, God bless him. I mean, no, this isn't a right. knock on Stephen A. Smith, but that like, why are you paying someone big, like that? Yeah, that kind of money. And then you're you're having to lay off all your actual reporters. Right. Did you ever notice like that's who gets laid off when ESPN makes these changes? It's like it's the people like making less money that actually, you know, report the news like Tom Rinaldi. How, how does it not a priority for you to keep Tom Rinaldi? It's like the only right. good thing that they had on game day. It's one of the Tom best Rinaldi. storytellers on yeah. the planet from a TV standpoint. But, yeah. you know, we're, we're going to keep Desmond Howard, but not Tom Rinaldi. Yeah, right. That makes perfect sense. Not Ed Word or guys like that. So, right. so again, this is why I keep saying, stop looking to ESPN for news. If you want to hear their opinions and you want to have some fun bashing them, go for it. I'll do that. Sure. But don't get worked up about what they say because they're not driving the actual agenda anymore of what the college football playoff is going to do from a standpoint of who's going to get in as of right, at least that's so as far they have it. Yeah. Right. And what they say about Notre Dame is not really who Notre Dame is. It's a, it's agenda driven. Right. The SEC is the best. Con Maybe that was true six seven years ago. It isn't really now. Yeah, they're going to consistently hype up these teams, and it's it's what you're going to. So know what you're getting into going in, but then don't buy the narratives. Exactly. Right. You want to you want to bring it here, and we can talk about it like Corey D did, which is fun because I like Hammer and ESPN. <laughs> uh, Omar says so. I have to watch ND games on my phone or iPad. You can watch it on your TV. You can hook it up if you have a smart TV. You could do it that way. If you have you know an HDMI cable, you could do it that way. It just makes it more complicated. I mean, bottom right. line, it, it's it just makes it more complicated. We have a smart TV, so we can hook it up there. But again, the quality of it on the TV is inconsistent. Yeah, that's the only problem we've had. Right. You know, we'll hook up YouTube TV. Like, I, so, like, I can I can use who YouTube TV. I have Netflix. I have Hulu. I have Pureflix. Like, I have a lot of those different things, streaming services already. 
And it's like, I did this initially to not pay as much money. Now I'm actually paying more money. Right. Because exactly. of all the different streaming they services. They nickel and dime you. It's like. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. And so I can watch them all on my TV on because I have a smart TV. But then you have to, we had to buy a new TV to be able to do that. <laughs> right. Exactly. Because what we were doing before is we had to hook the HDMI thing up. And then, and then, but then it's like, well, I need my computer to watch to, during games. I can't just do that. You, you can, but I can't do that because I need my computer for games. Right. Well, I can use my wife's laptop. Well, she needs hers too. She works all, you know, her business right. is built that way too. Right. So it, it's just, it's a pain in the behind to be completely honest with yeah, you. Yeah, exactly. And that's why but, I brought that up. Yeah. You, but Omar, you can watch it on your TV. You can also watch it on your computer. You can watch it on both. True. Of them. True. Yeah. Uh, Omar back in again, just kind of going down the ESPN road, I guess. ESPN is all over the place with their evaluation and prediction for Notre Dame. Number nine in the power ranking, five games that will shape the playoffs. But they also have four – they lose four to five games. ESPN makes no yeah, sense. Because they're using different things. Like one is right. – so they, they have like literally three rankings. It's the stupidest thing ever. Number one, they have the S&P Plus, which is the Bill Conley thing that has Notre Dame going 7-5. This is the same system that after LSU won the title by beating Clemson, who beat Ohio State, after that game, they still ranked LSU behind Ohio State and Clemson. The predictive model. Well, right. it's no longer predictive. It happened. You're right. <laughs> so right. when your predictive model says LSU still not as good as those teams, despite the fact they thoroughly thumped Clemson. Or, thoroughly. You know I mean? And everybody they played, frankly. Right. Right. Except like Auburn, right? Um, then you're then there's something wrong with your model, right? Like that's just the reality. So that's one. Then they have the FNP, the football power index. That's a different thing. And then this is the power rankings. And they'll do a power – usually it's Chris Lowe does it during the season. Like, they have, like, three different – it's like, what are you doing? Like, right, exactly. you know, pick pick a lane and stick in it. You know, yeah. like, it, it's so – it's. but to his point, it is all over the place. But you're usually right. reading three different things. Right, exactly. Uh, when you do those, which just makes it incredibly confusing and just another – like, there's no – there's no per, they just they've just, like, absorbed all these different things, and they haven't, like, put them into one coherent package. Right, exactly. It's just let's take this guy, let's take that guy, let's absorb this, let's eat this, and then there's going to vomit it all back to you. Oh, because no the more stuff you have plan. out there, the more clicks you're going to get, the more right. eyeballs you're going to get. The, right. You know, there's no coherent plan to it. Right, yeah, it's ridiculous. Michael Johnson says, "Why can't the linebackers be Drew, Bo, and Jack?" Well, the problem with that, and I, I think there may be times where we see that, Michael. That's a very good question. Yeah. I think there may be times we see that. The problem is, Bo and Drew are not great cover players. And in a lot of the teams that Notre Dame is going to play, if you're going into games where you've got those two guys on the field, you're going to have a hard time covering being successful in the pass game. And we saw this a little bit in the Alabama game. You know, Alabama with their running backs and their tight ends, their you know, sort of for example, the the touchdown pass they drew through to Jaleel Billingsley on that crossing route in the end zone. Bo Bowers got to pick that up, but he had no, he had, he never saw it. And, and Drew is a little bit better in recognition, but he's so short and he's not very long that he's not a super disruptive right. guy. He made that one play against Trevor Lawrence in the ACC title game where he tipped the pass. That, the just a, that was that was more of a bad throw by Trevor Lawrence than anything than anything else. Yeah. Uh, so so those are the two issues that they have with those two guys. Uh, they're just not great cover players. There's a time and a place for them to be on the field together. First and ten against USC or North Carolina. Or Cincinnati, it's probably right. not that time, right? In my opinion, but I, with the issues that we talk about at will, I understand that being a, a legitimate question, in my opinion. And if they're playing a team like Wisconsin, I could see them doing that. Yeah, but there's just not a lot of teams like Wisconsin anymore, Vince. No, that's a fact. Because uh, Notre Dame isn't playing the Big Ten. I mean, it's right. just, yeah. And even the Big Ten starting to go to more of these. I mean, yeah. Ohio State's a spread offense. Sure. Penn State's well, yeah. more of a spread offense. Even Michigan's gone to a spread offense. I mean, the, S, the, the West still has some of that. Iowa. You know, Wisconsin, right, right, but but uh, there's a lot more of the spread the field stuff sure. now, even in the Big Ten. A couple of uh, record predictions. Kenny Moore says eleven and one. Chief Brody, uh, he says uh, ten and two purely because Notre Dame never goes undefeated in odd numbered years. Uh, he says 2012, 2018, 2020. Next year undefeated. This year yeah. ten and two. And then That's you can even go back to nineteen eighty eight. Yeah, exactly. Right. They didn't go undefeated in 2020, though. In my, I, I don't think they did. I count the ACC title game as a regular season game. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, it's part of the regular season. Right. Right. I don't count yeah. that as like yeah. 2012. 
right. you know, it, to me, or 2018. I, I view it as different, especially since it's only the 11th game. It'd be different sure. if it was like the 13th game, like it normally is. Yeah. But it was the 11th game. So it's just my my two cents on that. Sean Rogers says if the O line is solid, 12 and 0. If they're a dumpster fire, 10 and 2. Yeah, that's fair. I, that's actually not bad. Assessment. 12 and 0, I still think that's going to be tough. It's just so hard to go undefeated. Yeah. But yeah, we sure. will do a records prediction show uh, as we get closer to fall camp for sure. And that'll get really fun. And we're just going to air all of your predictions and we're going to have a fun way that you have to, you know, if you're going to get your thing aired, you have to, you have to tell us who they're going to lose to, or, you know, a couple other things. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to really yeah. try to make that. We're going to give our opinion and our end, but then course. we're going to really make it interactive and make it fun. So we'll probably do that about two weeks before this, about a week and a half before the first game. So we get a little closer. Like, so before we dive into Florida state prep week, we'll do it like right before that. Right. It'd be a lot of fun. Sean has some rebuttal to the undefeated next year. He says uh, they play the Ohio State next year and have Clemson at home. I'm the biggest homer on the planet, but we'd be lucky to split those two. Well, if you're the biggest homer on the planet, then you're not, then you're then <laughs> not the biggest. Them winning both of those games. Yeah, not because I biggest. know people that think they're going to win both. No, but but all, all seriousness, Sean. I mean, yeah. I mean, as of right now, sure, sure. I mean, and I would say that'd be true if Alabama was playing. If Alabama's next year had to play at Clemson or at Ohio State at home against Clemson, I'd say they're going to be lucky to split those two games. That's true for everybody. Sure, absolutely. You know, so yes. it, it, the key for me is not so much that. Notre Dame has to win them both to be in the playoff because again that narrative is now destroyed. If they're still going to make the playoff by when they lose the last game of the season by twenty four, they're going to be fine by losing the first game. The key, however, for me is it just has to be a competitive game. It doesn't necessarily have to come down to the final play, but it has to be a competitive game. Yeah, that's going to be the key. You can't you can't get destroyed by Ohio State. That that's that's going to be the key. Ronald says pretty soon we're going to have to get a second job to pay for yeah. the ATV. No <laughs> doubt. You're not wrong, dude. No, he's not wrong at all. You are not wrong. Well, I was going to retire, but I can't watch TV anymore. So <laughs> it's like, hey, all you retired people, just sit down and watch TV. We're going to make it so yeah. expensive that you can't retire. Yeah, exactly. What am I going to do in retirement? I wanted to watch TV. And I... So I can't retire. <laughs> right. Uh, let's see. Sean says, I'm okay with our cornerbacks. Uh, the reason I think our D line put so much pressure on opposing quarterbacks that it makes them look much better than they currently are. I agree with that to a degree. I agree with that against like 10 opponents. But as we saw against Clemson in 2018, when you play the best team, so it may not affect them to the playoff, uh, or maybe if they lose a game and make you know a big major bowl game, it won't affect them. It may not affect them until then, or maybe just one regular season game. But when they play the best teams on the schedule, Vince, I don't care how good you are, you're you're gonna have to you're gonna have to be able to cover. Yeah, no question. Because we saw Trevor Lawrence. Notre Dame harassed Trevor Lawrence the whole game. There's about five or only five or six plays where they couldn't get to him, and on those five or six plays, on like four of them, he hit big plays. Yeah. So you got to cover, and Notre Dame doesn't have Julian Love on this team. OC Irish fan, uh, coach. My phrase is controlled aggression. For example, not letting the quarterback escape potential sack or giving up. Uh, as the defensive yeah. end, giving up the edge is what he's referring he was referring to, and then referring to my comment about yeah. the controlled rage thing. Yeah, I always, I always, I always told my running backs, run like you're pissed off. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that that's what I would tell. Them. That's how you see a good running back. You run like you got a score to settle, basically, and that's I love that. Uh, Eddie Eddie McQuitty says, Andy always has issues in DB coverage. Uh, teams with elite quarterbacks attack them quick. Need to make sure the front line can pressure consistently. So if the secondary has issues, they make up for it. I'm going to strongly disagree with that. Notre Dame was in the top six nationally in passing defense in the 2018 and 2019 seasons. Uh, Clemson, uh, as we've talked about, didn't start hurting Notre Dame until their All-American cornerback got hurt. So I'm, I'm going to push back on that a little bit. Yes, for much of the last 20 years, that's been true. But in 2018, Notre Dame has had one of the three or four best secondaries in the entire country. I've talked to coaches that that know Clemson coaches that said they were more worried about Notre Dame than they were Bama that year. Once they beat Notre Dame, they knew they're going to win the championship in 2018 because they were more concerned about Notre Dame because the defense. Notre Dame had a way better defense than Alabama, and part of that was the secondary. And and Clemson has Clemson coaches have talked to people about hey, you know. 
when Julian Love went down, that was our chance. We knew it. And we knew that was our chance, yeah, and that's they, exactly yeah. what they did because I mean, they knew they were going to have a hard time moving the ball on Notre Dame if he didn't go down. They knew yeah. it. So I, now, was that true in 2020? Yeah, it was true in 2020. What you're saying, Eddie, is true in 2020 at times in 2019, but not not really. Not that their cornerbacks played pretty well in 2019. But for a lot of years, yeah, that's true, but it's not always. And especially recently, they've had – more really good years in coverage than, than they've had not good years recently. Yeah. Sean Terry, when considering the balance between, on one hand, top of the depth chart talent, and on the other hand, quality depth, how does this year's offense and defense compare to those from previous seasons? That is a loaded question. That's a good question. That's I a think. great question. Um, that's like a that's a topic for an entire show question. <laughs> yeah, I, I look at that and I say, so on one hand, top of the depth chart talent, and on the other hand, quality depth. See, I think what makes this team a little bit special is I think this team is going to have more of the top end talent than last year's team. And I know you can, how does that happen in one year? It's because certain guys are now coming into their, I mean, look, last year, Kyron Williams, Kyle Hamilton, Isaiah Foskey, I mean, I could go down. They were sophomores, right? Cam Hart, sophomore. Yeah. You know, they're now juniors. They're now veterans. They're now older players. Jared Patterson's going into his third year as a starting offensive lineman. Now, Chris Tyree's now going into year two. Kevin Austin, you know, if healthy, is 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 a, an elite receiver that's going to be much better than what they had last year. Again, this is a, this is an asterisk. If if healthy, I think the high level t- Jason Adamiola, you know, coming into his own. I think the high end talent on this team if everybody's healthy, is going to look a lot more like the 2012 team. Because that's the one thing the 2012 team had. They did not have great depth. But they're hot. That to me, that team in the 2015 team were the two Notre Dame teams that had the most R5 or as good as anybody's top five. I would say that about, I mean, I'll take Manti, Tyler Eifert, Zach Martin, Stefan Tuitt, and Lewis Nix and put them up against anybody's top five in 2012. Anybody. The problem is, after that, there was a bit of a, you know, and, you know, there's the the Chris Watt, there's a couple guys, that, but once you got down past like eight, there was a big gap between eight and 20 for Bama and Notre Dame. And of course there was, you know, so, so that's the difference. This year, I think Notre Dame is going to have a top five that can compete with anybody. But what makes yeah. this team, in my opinion, special is also, I think this team has really good depth at most, but nobody has great depth everywhere. I don't think anybody does. But this team has a, a lot of depth at all the key positions. And so I think that's why this is a, a unique situation for Notre Dame. Richard Robinson says, great discussion. For me, you nailed the linebacker position. Neither guy played well last year. Who do you think turns it around? Or will the Prince pull a Manti and start? I uh, I don't think Prince is going to start yeah, I don't year. see that happening either. We're hearing enough good things, I think, about those two guys that I don't see Prince coming in and starting. Um, mm-hmm. I, I really don't. But, you know, my prediction as to if they'll turn it around, <laughs> I hope so. But that's why right. it's a question for us. I mean, right. I, I'm he- we're hearing good things, but you hear good things about a lot of guys in July. Um, and so I, I need to see it, especially right. after seeing what we saw last year. And right. uh, if you guys remember last year, the reason that Shane Simon kept getting starts is because – According to the staff, he was doing great in practice. Right. You know, and so frankly, all the way through August, if Shane Simon's killing it, I still need to see him in a game. Um, right. Just because of what happened last year. Right. And that should be true of anybody. At some point in time, right. you have to be able to say, okay, yeah, this guy's a great practice player. He ain't a gamer. Or yeah. this guy may not be a great practice player. He's a gamer. Uh, I, I don't think Notre Dame has done necessarily a great job of making that decision that correct at right. certain some certain positions in my opinion yeah exactly not a great job in a lot of other areas but that's one of those where it's like eventually like okay maybe he practices better than jack lamb but <laughs> jack lamb's always been a more productive player than right. Shane Simon. always He's been on the field always and he will continue to be yeah <laughs> just agree saying. hey i agree. Sorry, i shouldn't go down that road no but, i mean it's i mean it's, we're not it's taking just, shots at him it's just you know it is what it is i mean no one's perfect right yeah but right uh, D Rock yeah. says, "My 90 year old dad will freak out when he finds out about this." About yeah, referring to the Peacock thing, exactly. Yeah. And like I said, that's the segment of people that I'm talking about. It's not right, man. That that's right. not right. I'm the the expression you can't teach old dog new tricks. Like they shouldn't have to. Right. 
They, they shouldn't have to learn new right. tricks, man. They should be able to turn because it's that older up. generation that that that's that helped build Notre Dame up to what it is. They to where got they on can that NBC contract like in the first right. place. Yes, right, exactly. Martin Demo is looking on the bright side. I guess he says the chances of me spilling my beer on my TV is far less likely to happen than on my phone or laptop watching the game. Mm-hmm. That's, that's a we're looking for some silver line, and I appreciate that. People, uh, Jay Wiki says, just vote with your wallet. You know, if this bombs, they won't try it again. Yeah, it'll slow it down at least. Yeah, you know, I mean, yep. but that's the thing is, look, if if this is if this bothers you that much, then, um, then don't do it. Right. You know, just it's it's Toledo, right? I mean, right. And I think what they're doing is it's partly they're doing against. It's the you know it's the, I don't think they would have picked the Toledo game maybe if it was like later in the year but because it is the first game home game there's going to be a lot of excitement it's like hey let's try to take advantage of it but yeah right and if it goes well who knows they may try to do it again later in the year I I see you know? it I, I could easily see it I I, yeah. I I think regardless of what people do it, it this is the path that they're going to mm-hmm. go on and I don't know that enough people saying no is going to be enough I just Right. Maybe I'm pessimistic, um, but with everything else I've seen, I just it's almost like I throw my hands in the air like you got me. OK, I mean, right. I don't know what else to do. You know what I mean? Right. I just it's depressing. Uh, Ronald said I bought a 90 inch Sony so I could be inside the dang huddle with the players to heck with a dang phone. Right. <laughs> now, again, you can you can still watch it right. on your TV. That's fine. Uh, if if you have the certain kind of TV, and if you bought a ninety inch TV out Sony, I would imagine it's a, it's smart, a smart TV. TV. Yeah, um, but smart TVs are not the easiest thing for older people. I I've had I had trouble hooking mine up. I'd be like, Ange, can you come down here and fix this? Because I can't figure it out. <laughs> right. So yes, exactly. Yeah. And I can yep. only imagine what my dad is going to you know be dealing with on it. Yes. Yeah, and that's and that 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 again, that's my biggest knock on this whole thing. That's my biggest knock. Let's see here. Uh, I got one here, Vince. So as you're as you're looking, says uh, hopefully Freeman's fresh set of eyes. uh, See how absolutely horrible those two were at will. Hopefully he can coach them up. But right now, I'd rather see Drew and Bo slide over. But but again, you're you're making that case from from ignorance. And and when I mean ignorance, I'm not saying you're ignorant. I'm saying lack of ignorance. And I probably should use a different word, but lack of seeing it. Right? Like I'm. You're you're making that case because you've never seen Bo Bauer and Drew White play the will position you've never seen it. So it's kind of like when people fall in love with freshmen, Vince, it's like, mm-hmm. well, uh, they freshmen should play. Why? Well, Cause those guys struggled. Well, what'd the freshman do last year? Nothing. Cause he was in high school, right? These guys used to be high, top recruits too. So it's like, I've seen this guy struggle. I've never seen that guy struggle. Well, you've never seen him struggle because he's never played that position before. And, and so number one, I think Shane was pretty horrible at will last year. I don't think Maris was horrible at will last year. I think Maris was inconsistent at will last year, but he also made some plays at will last year. So I think I, I think I'd look at it just a little bit differently, and you know I, I just that's kind of where I'm at. I, I just I yeah. understand where you're coming from, but I don't think either one of those guys are are wills not on a full time basis because you have to be able to cover as a will. You just do, and I don't know mm-hmm. if now again could Bo go out there and, and all of a sudden a lot better in coverage this spring or this fall? Sure, it's possible. And maybe that happens, and we do see exactly what Michelangelo and and uh, uh, who was the other person that that brought that up? Who was it? Michael Johnson was the other person that asked Might that have question. Been, yeah, yeah. You know, may, maybe that ends up being it. But based on what we've seen right now, I don't think we could say that that would be any better. Yeah, in my yeah. opinion, Again, except against maybe Wisconsin. Right. Uh, interesting takedown here, Brian. Uh, I'm going to put up two different comments. Okay, mm-hmm. so. Uh, Martin Demo says, no high school kid is going to watch Peacock just to see Notre Dame. And Robert uh, says, it's going to hurt recruiting. What are your thoughts on that? I don't know enough about whether or not high school kids are already on these streaming. I, sure. I, I don't, I don't, they, they may already be on it. I don't, I don't know. Well, I, yeah, go ahead. I, I, I just, I'm, I, I don't have a teenage son. I don't have a son, period. I don't have a teenage son. I'm not, I'm not doing recruiting anymore. I don't know what these kids are on anymore. They may already be on, peacock and that's how they watch whatever shows they watch i have no idea but 
my it, my gut would be to agree with those those comments. That would be my gut. Is you're you're making yourself less accessible. I don't see in what world that's better for you. But then that's partly why maybe why they picked the Toledo game. That's probably a game a lot of kids aren't going to be watching anyway. They're not doing it for the USC game, right? Or the Cincinnati right, game. They're right. doing it for the Toledo game, right? How many high school recruits are like, man, I cannot wait to watch Notre Dame with Toledo on Saturday? You know, just it's just probably not it. But yeah, I, I guess my my take on the whole thing is okay. If you're being recruited by Georgia, for example, you have to have some sort of a subscription to watch their games. Um, if you're being recruited by Alabama, same thing. You got to have the SEC network. You got to have ESPN. I don't think kids. I, I just don't see that being an issue. I, I don't. I, I yeah, but see again. I, I think that ESPN is a little bit of a different animal, though. Vince, ESPN is more common for people to have than Peacock or Paramount or you, you know what I mean. Like they're already sure. going to have ESPN no matter what. They already have it. This is different. This isn't like it's already on ESPN. It's a different service. They'd actually have to have that. So no, they're already going to watch Notre Dame on ESPN because, like you said, a lot of these guys are already going to have that stream. They got the ESPN app, or whatever the case may be, right? They're already paying for that. Or, how many of these kids are on Peacock? That's what's the unknown. I don't know. How many of these well, kids are on Paramount? That's the unknown. I will say unknown. this. I will say I don't this. Know. All the kids that I've dealt with, I shouldn't say all, many of the kids that I have dealt with on a regular basis don't even watch live sports. They Which don't. is kind of sad. It's super they don't sad. have the attention span to sit down and watch. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm yeah. saying. Like these kids will go on their official visits and they'll do all that. They don't want like, for example, I, we, the difference between a kickoff and a punt when the ball is rolling around on the ground. Right. One's live. One's not. Right. These kids have no idea the difference because they don't watch football. Right? You're talking about you're not talking about football players. You're talking about student. Like normal, no, 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 no. I'm normal. talking about football players. Hundred, yeah, I, exactly. Okay. That has not been my experience, but that's kind of wild. Well, yeah, I'm talking about wild. high school kids. Like right now, they don't yeah. watch professional sports. These like baseball professional players, they don't sports, watch, sure, but they yeah. don't watch it. They they don't watch they don't watch uh, games anymore. At least the the vast majority yeah. of the kids that I deal with don't watch games, um, and they want the highlights. They they want the quickly consumable product as opposed to watching the you know minutia so of an if, entire game. if what you're saying is true that makes this decision even dumber because the people that do sit and watch the game are going to be less apt to to have an app like do the that. streaming stuff yeah sure right. yeah right absolutely yeah i'm with you on that one I, I i think this is a terrible idea because i think the core of the people that are notre dame fans are people that probably are not streaming on a regular basis right that I, I don't know the I mean that for me would be pure that, speculation, but it's it is it's speculation. Most of the people that I know don't have streaming services, right? Right. But I don't. I that's I mean that's a, a small number of what is a pretty large fan base. So yeah, yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah, a little no, frustrating. Yeah. Chief Brody says at the end of the day, the power lies with the consumer. If you really want to see change, stop giving them money. To be honest, that's it. That's yeah. it. No question. No question. Oh, uh, <laughs> I, I do have to put this one up. D-Rock says, it's wants versus needs. Set your priorities with your budget. I'll wait and get the final analysis of the Toledo game through Irish Breakdown. And we'll give it. We Vince will, will be it. covering the game. I'll be sitting in the stands. It's We'll get plenty of analysis from it. So No question. Yep. Yep. Here we go. Where are you at, question. Vince? I am at 251. Okay. Uh, Liam Gaming says, "Can Tyree be as effective in inside zone as outside zone?" Yeah, I believe his. I'm going to look it up now, but I thought his 90-something yard touchdown run against Syracuse that was. was uh, I thought it was an inside zone. I think his. I think his touchdown run against Clemson was also, um, on inside zone. But I'm going to. I'm going to look those up right now. So go ahead and find another question, Vince. While I sure. I look for these. But yeah, I believe I believe that was the case. This is an interesting comment from Kevin. He says there are a few ways to stream college football uh, guys without paying for them. Uh, you just need a VPN. See, I don't even know what a VPN is. Yeah, it's a little. So, I, I, but that goes to the larger point of mm, I, I would assume that a lot of people don't. Not I'm not saying most because I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's speculation. But again, if you're not tech savvy. 
people are screwed. I mean, it's right. just, that's the issue. Right. Yeah, Chris Tyree's touchdown run against Syracuse was on a inside zone play. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. I mean, again, because the thing about Chris Tyree is he is sort of a one cut and go slasher kind of guy. Right. And the inside zone is great for that. Yes, exactly. Uh, and that's I mean, that's kind of where yep. you where you want to be. So here we go. John Murphy. Love the show from the Philippines. Hope to meet up in 2024. So that would mean he is serving our country. So I, I, I would imagine. What it would there. Mean. So that's thank you. If that is true, John, uh, John, I really appreciate your service. Yes. Very, very much. Uh, here, here's an interesting one, and it's speculation, of course, and we we, we, we deal in speculation around here. Uh, Jay Wiki Jr. says, do you think if, to, if Tobias Merriweather commits tonight, that could push Williams to want to sign with Notre Dame, or would it push him away? Okay, so uh, first of all, Chris Tyree's touchdown run against Clemson was also – on an inside zone play. So it was again, just a cut to the outside. Yeah. He just bounced it back. Uh, I guarantee you that CJ Williams and Tobias Merriweather both know what each other's doing <laughs> and they've both already made their. So like CJ is not going to make a decision and then announce it. he's already made his decision, which is why he's announcing it when nine out of 10 times when a kid sets a commitment date, it's because he now knows where he's going and he's just going to announce it. Sure. Rarely. I think the only time you really see that is when kids are signing on signing day. I think sometimes that's when you're going to find more kids that are really going into the night before a little bit more uncertain. So no, CJ's decision has been made. Tobias's decision has been made. And I guarantee you those two kids communicated their decision with each other. So we'll have, tell you what, Jay wiki come back tonight and I'll have more on that. Okay. Like so, that. so actually, Jeez. you know what? Wait till Sunday. I gotta wait till yeah, Sunday. That's a good point. That's <laughs> to, a good point. to talk about that. Yeah. So so ask me that again on Sunday. <laughs> uh Brandon uh, is on the same lines here. He says the idea of Notre Dame and Coach Alexander landing my dream class at wide receiver surprisingly has a good chance to become reality. Walker, who's already committed, Merriweather, Williams, either Bradshaw or Everhart. Crazy to see this come to fruition. I'm curious, Brandon, was Walker part of your dream class to begin with, or is he part of your dream class because he's already committed? Because he's already here. Because I, I think there's two ways to look at it. I'm just curious. I mean, that's a fair question. I mean, if I was going to do a Notre Dame dream class right now, I would include every committed kid in it because I'm not going to advocate for them pushing a the kid out of the class, right? So I, I am just, I'm just curious about that. That's all. Orange Glove Guy says, if the receiver recruits are aware that they may be relegated to the scout team, why would they commit to this class? Because I don't think that they're – Then my dad asked this question, like, why would a top quarterback sign with Notre Dame? And I was like, because kids don't think, well, just because it was like that for the other kid doesn't mean it's going to be different for me. I mean, and, and I guarantee Notre Dame's not telling them, hey, you're going to sit for three years. They're, they're telling them you're going to come in and play right away. Sure. And we'll find out this year if that's going to be true or not, if the young players play. But I do think that's what's made it harder. But this is why I go back to, and this is a great question, this is why I go back to this notion that it's hard to recruit at Notre Dame is so overblown. Because Tobias Mary, what are the two schools that Tobias Merriweather visited officially? Notre Dame and Stanford. The SI-99 just came out. Tobias Merriweather is ranked as the number 46 player in the country. 247 ranks him number 75. He's a top player. He visited Notre Dame and Stanford. That's it. Didn't give Washington the time of day. Why is he looking at those two schools? They have, exactly. <laughs> There's more kids like that than you realize. And also, yeah. a lot of these kids are confident enough, like, hey, I know that guy didn't play, but I'm not Jordan Johnson. I'm Tobias right. Merriweather, or I'm right. CJ Williams, or I'm, you know, uh, Luther Burden, or whoever else. You know what I mean? Like, that they don't look at it that way. So I, I, I get where you're coming from. I do. And I think eventually that could hurt Notre Dame. But look, Notre Dame's been able to overcome this for a while. Eventually, it's going to catch up to them. But I'm hoping that this is the year that it's not going to it's not going to be an issue because I I do believe we're going to see Lorenzo Styles and potentially Deion Colsey a little bit more we've seen in the past. That could just be me wishful thinking. Yeah. But you know, and part of it it is. But that's that's where I'm at. Benjamin Weiss has a very interesting question. He says, if the O line becomes really bad and starts quote unquote catching this year. How much does that hinder our D line development? I believe the starting lines scrimmage against each other a lot. Correct. 
I don't think it hurts it because the, the defensive line is going to be coached to not to just whoop them. It's not going to stop the D line from being effective. They're just going to whoop them and yeah. they're going to be working on their own technique. Um, I, I don't think it hurts the offensive line. If that's what they're being taught to do, then that's just what they're being taught to do. Yeah. So I don't think it'll necessarily hurt them. I think it'll just make the deal line, the O line just not be as good, honestly. Um, so he, I got a super chat down here. Corey D says, is, is Merriweather more like Randy Moss or Bobby Brown? So first of all, I would never, ever, ever compare a high school receiver to Randy Moss. Yeah, right. I right. just did be so incredibly unfair. He was right. And what I mean by that is not just that he was a great player, but he was a unique player. He was, yeah. He literally had no weaknesses. I mean, as a player, he had some other, you know, things. But as a player, he, he was he was fast and elusive. I mean, he was incredibly fast and elusive. At 6'4", you don't find those things to get phenomenal ball skills, great instincts as a receiver. He had every single trait you could ask for. Now, a physical trait that you could ask for. I would never compare a receiver to him, in my in most likely. Yeah. Uh, and and Merriweather is not Bobby Brown because and Bobby Brown, Florida Notre Dame receiver for you young bucks, uh, he's more explosive, a, a lot more explosive than Bobby Brown was. I don't remember Bobby as a high school player. I'm just going off of what Bobby was in college. Uh, Tobias is, is more explosive than Bobby is, more elusive as well than Bobby is, and I would imagine a better prospect. But again, I don't know what kind of prospect Bobby Brown was. He was a good player at Notre Dame, but not a difference maker. Tobias, to me, has the potential to be a difference maker. I mean, honestly, Tobias is probably the best. If, if they get him and then ultimately sign him, he'd probably be their best receiver commit of the Brian Kelly era to be honest with you, in my opinion. That's how high I am on him. Michael Johnson jumping back in. He says, why is, is Iowa State getting so much love from the college football experts? They have a they have a pretty good coach. Storyline. They have a pretty Story good line. coach. They got a pretty good quarterback, pretty good running, really good yeah. running back, right? Outside they of that. Baseball. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, they've got everybody coming back from last year. True. Everybody. True. I mean, but, they got Charlie Kohler at tight end. They got a bunch of dudes coming back on defense. But the, uh, the hype train for Iowa State was was in full go when they yeah. were going to play Notre Dame uh, in the in the bowl game, and Notre Dame just punished them. Right. I mean, it was it was, they didn't even belong in the same field. Right. And that Notre Dame toyed with for a minute, but that and was Notre Dame didn't play super great that game. No, they just I agree. Toyed with them. I you, agree. You covered that game. They just yeah, that game was them. over before it started. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it, toyed with them. Was never in doubt. That game was never in doubt. Um, and so I, I left the stadium like I expected more from Iowa State yeah. based on everything that I had heard. But um, that's what was so dumb about it. Cause they were seven yeah. and five. Right. Exactly. Yeah, they were seven point. and five. Thank you. You know, and and yeah, they were really good last year. But you know, when you look at it and say they 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 were pretty good last year, had a really nice bowl win over Oregon. It was not a good Oregon team. It battled, beat Oklahoma once, battled them again, beat Texas on the road. I mean, they were a good football team last year, but they also lost to Louisiana Lafayette last year. Does anyone think Notre Dame would be getting hyped up as a top 10 team if they'd have lost to Louisiana Lafayette last year at any right. time of the season? Not a chance. Not a chance. Not a chance. Not a chance. But no, Iowa State's a good football team. It's, it's kind of like, but you know, it's like to me, the even bigger example, Michael, is North Carolina. Like in that ESPN football power, yeah, they're North Carolina one spot behind Notre Dame. There's two services that have North Carolina ranked ahead of Notre Dame. Yeah. Based on yeah. what? Notre Dame punt destroyed North Carolina, and they lost their top. It was people. a competitive game for a quarter, and then yeah. North Carolina couldn't. North after after they went after they got to 14 points, I think they only crossed midfield once the rest yeah. of the game. Right, and and. They lost two thousand yard running backs, a thousand yard. Their top two receivers and their all league linebacker, and yet they're just going to be even better than they were. That right? Based exactly. on what? Yeah. Maybe they will be. Maybe they will be. But based on what? Right. They went seven Not and six and eight and four the last two years. No. Who's the? What's the big win they've had? They lost to Virginia and Florida State last year. What? What's the big win that? So you? So they they battled Notre Dame for a half and. All, you know, almost beat Clemson two years ago. That's what you're building it around. If that was right. Notre Dame's resume, they'd be like, Notre Dame's not going to make a bowl game this year. Right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Great response from Tommy Guns about Iowa State, by the way. Michael, they're trying, they're uh, getting Iowa State ready to be the flagship program of the Little 12. There you <laughs> that's, go. That's a great response. I love that. There you uh, go. Robert says, I just called my 68 year old diehard dad, gave him the good news about Peacock. He hung up on me. Nice. Priceless. 
<laughs> nice. <laughs> that's great. Nice. Oh, I love that because that's exactly how I would feel if I was in your dad's place. I, mm-hmm. That's exactly how I would feel. Yeah, it's frustrating. Uh, Mark, uh, Mark Brammer says the forward pass, wishbone option, offense, nine man defensive line by Miami, RPO offense. What do you think will be the next future trend in college football? I think the next trend will be something that we've seen before. I, I've said this before. I think as more and more teams go to smaller, faster defenses, someone somewhere is, and we kind of saw Stanford do this back in 09, 2010, and 11. As that Pac-12 got smaller and faster on defense, Stanford got bigger and stronger and just yeah. beat people up. It'll, it'll be something like that, and and it'll be some of like if you look at if you really study the read zone, it's a it's the triple option. It is it's just different. It's just, it's just spread run, out a little. Bit. Yeah, it's yeah. the triple yeah. option. There's, there's no reinventing the wheel. Yeah. Um. The, it, you know. It'll it'll be, but it'll be something like that. It'll be some form of a, a little different version, and we're kind of already seeing it with teams like Ohio State and teams like Oklahoma that are these spread teams that run the ball a ton. And so I think we're I think we're going to see that, and that's why as Vince and I have always talked about the need for RPOs and the need for you know more explosive playmakers. One thing you've never heard us do is talk about how run game isn't important, or they don't need to worry about running the ball. It, it, because I think I think that's still going to always be a part of who Notre Dame is, and I think there's going to be an advantage, especially if they kind of get into the ACC, as we saw last year. Notre Dame was not a very good offense, but you know what they did week after week? They just beat people up. Yeah, just physically beat people up, and, and I think there's merit to that. Benjamin Weiss, I know you like a more diverse wide receiver room than the Notre Dame coaching staff does. I get the idea of diversity, but I also don't see why a room full of power forwards isn't ideal at the end of the day if you can. Go watch. Oh, I'm sorry, there's more. Uh, at the end of the day, if you can outsize the DBs, it's as simple as throw it up and let them go get it, right? It's not that simple because there's things you can do to take that away schematically. You can play cover two, and that's gone. You know, um, in we saw in 2018 when go watch Cotton Bowl, Clemson had a six foot two and a six foot one cornerback, and the the margins for error, the 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 space they were getting in that game was a whole lot less than they were getting in other games. You also aren't going to complete that pass 18 times, you know, and, and so I think there's, but but again, why do you need three of those guys if you have one or two of them? Because again. I've never said, gee, they shouldn't have had Chase Claypool and Miles Boykin right. outside in 2018 or guys like that. I've never said don't recruit C.J. Williams and Tobias Merriweather. What I've said is don't recruit four of those guys. Right. I've never said don't recruit those guys. You've got Deion Coles. You, if they get Tobias Merriweather, him. if they get C.J. Williams, have a guy like him. You've got those big physical guys. Now get some guys that can scare defenses because the reality is, Benjamin, is you're going to face a team like Alabama last year would not have been as threatened by the big receivers as 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 most teams, because Patrick Sertan is over six feet tall. Josh Job's a big guy. That's what hurt Notre Dame in 2012, because they could just put DJ Milner on Tyler Eifert and be physical with them, and, and they couldn't keep winning those one-on-ones. And then the one time Tyler did outplay him for the ball, just wrote, just wrote him out of bounds. Remember that play where Tyler tried to get his foot down and they ruled him out of bounds? Because those big physical corners could say, hey, you may, you may catch the ball on me, but you're not coming down in bounds. Right. And it, there's not like the rule, like the they didn't they used to have a rule in the NFL. Maybe they still do. Where like if you get pushed out, you, yeah, they do. right. Yeah, you can't. College get football's out. never had that. So <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Just <laughs> I, I'm I'm a big fan of back. I mean, I complained last year they didn't throw enough back shoulders, but you can't make a help. You can't have a heavy dose of that because again, that's going to work against ten or eleven teams on your schedule. It may work on twelve teams on your schedule if you're playing the kind of schedules Notre Dame's had recently. Sure, but if you want to win a championship, you're going to get to the postseason and. Like, like, look, if a team does that and they're going to play Notre Dame in three years and they're going to try to do that on – or two years, they're going to try to do that on Cam Hart and Ryan Barnes and Devin Moore and Benjamin Morrison and all these Good giants luck. that Notre Dame's recruiting a cornerback, you're going to suck. We're going to dominate you. Yeah, You're going to hit some of them, but not enough to consistently move the chains. And where's your threat to really – to keep the safeties off the hash – on the hash? You know, so if you give me a really fast, dynamic player in the slot, 
and you're going to have your safeties go help protect on the outside against those back shoulders and those go routes and stuff, then I'm going to eat you up on the inside. But if I got another big on the inside, teams can just put you know linebackers, match up yeah. linebackers on them and things like that. So it just gives the better teams better opportunities to beat you. And let's be honest, we have not seen a team with a bunch of power forwards go win because that's not how LSU's receivers played in 2019. They had two 6'4 receivers and a 6'1 receiver that was about 210 pounds. They had big guys. But Justin Jefferson did not play like Miles Boykin and Chase Claypool. He was as smooth and as a elite of a route runner as you're going to find. And, it, I mean, that was 6'4". He just happened to be 6'4", but he played right. the game more like Jerry Judy did. You know, is a different skill set. The the power forward is simply is meant to not necessarily be a big guy. It's more of a because you can do certain type of things. You need to be able to attack people different ways. And also, I think when you play that way, it then makes your it makes it a little tougher for your tight end position because now teams are able to kind of go bigger on you. And and I just don't think it's the best way to have an efficient and explosive offense. And there's the other thing too. Usually those power forward guys aren't game wreckers speed wise. That very right. rare. even Miles Boykin ran a four four two. Miles Boykin didn't play like a guy that ran a four four two. Right, right. He was a guy that he was going to make the catch, and that's where the play was going to end. Right. Whereas, and that's not a knock. Chase to a degree did that, but Chase didn't do that against Georgia. Right. He didn't do that against Michigan teams that because what did Georgia have at corner? They had two big corners. Now, one of those guys got knocked out, but their second round, their second group of corners were also bigger corners. They could be physical with Chase, which made Ian not as comfortable to go to him as he was against some of the teams that weren't as good. So you have to have a skill set that that says, hey, look, you need to have some of those game records that can turn a five yards. Like Chase Claypool could maybe beat you over the top, but he wasn't taking a slant route and going 80 yards. Miles Boykin right. maybe could beat you on a goal route for a 40-yard touchdown. He wasn't taking a hitch route, making people miss. You need those different type of skill sets to be effective. And you look at Clemson, different skill sets of their receivers. Right. Alabama, I mean, look, they were all small. But Devontae Smith and Ch- Jalen Waddle had two completely different games, and neither of them – and John Mitchie wasn't like e- – Mitchie wasn't like either one of them. Right? So this isn't a size thing. This is a skill set thing. LSU had three bigger guys, but they could play J- – J- Justin Jefferson and Jamar Chase had completely different games, completely different skill sets, even though they were both bigger guys. And John- and Terrace Marshall wasn't like either one of them. And, and so that's kind of where um, – yeah. We got a super chat, Brian. You want to go ahead and grab that one? Chili, my man. $15 super chat, buddy. I appreciate that very, very much. Uh, He says, hey, fellas, doesn't YouTube take some super chat proceeds? What about adding a cash app also? So, Chili, I appreciate the super chat very much. And this is a great question because what that's partly what we've done with our message board. So, number one, the way that our message board is set, we get 99% of the proceeds from from people that sign up for the Irish Breakdown message board. We get either PayPal or Stripe, whoever we go with, takes like a small cut out of it. So if you sign up for a $49.99 for an annual membership, we get like a dollar seventy taken out and then we get everything else, right? If you sign up for $4.99 a month, they take out like 44 cents in a month and we keep the rest. So what we did was we created the message board that way. So you can sign up for $4.99 a month and then you you know kind of recurring you can sign up for a 49.99 annual membership or you also created the booster club which is people that just choose to give even more money they still get message board access and all that so those are ways that you can support us where the the 99 plus percent of the revenue comes back to us and that's part of the reason that we did that um i didn't really necessarily want to do that that was my wife's idea and it's it's been great for us so far uh, the booster club aspect of it. It was a, it was a great, it turned out to be a great idea because I, I didn't think people would want to do that, but we've had a lot of people do that, which is humbling awesome. and shocking, which is but awesome. also awesome. Yeah. And look, I've always told you, if we make that kind of money, we're going to, we're going to invest it back into the company. Yep. So yep. I'm, I'm, I'm doing interviews this week to hire people to help cover the team. Right. Some different. So, so then I can then go start focusing more on the stuff that I do well, which is breaking things down and all that. And right. I don't have to do as much of the beat stuff. So I've always told you, this doesn't go into Brian Driscoll's pocket. I don't. Hey, babe, look, we got this extra money. Vacation time. My <laughs> salary is gonna. My salary is gonna stay the same every month. Yeah. I and Vince will tell you. I use that to v- invest back into the company to grow awesome. the company to do more things and, you know, and, and that's that's what it's gonna be. So yeah, I'm pumped uh, about the interviews yeah. too. I, it's this is exciting times for yeah. the company. So yeah. 
That's all right. But I appreciate the super chat very yeah. much. Really. But that's the way that Thanks, if, you know, if, if you want to support us, but I've had people say this, Hey, I don't want to do the super chat cause I don't want to give YouTube like 35% of the cut. Then, then you can, there's things you can do on the, on the site to do that, to help us out. And, and you can see it down here, boards, at irishbreakdown.com. Christopher Sally says, I'm actually going to have a Toledo watch party now and invite friends and relatives over who do not have Peacock trying to make lemonade out of lemons. Good man, Chris. I imagine, Chris, you already have Peacock. Uh, that's what it sounds so. like to me. Yeah. yeah, which I get that. I get it. <laughs> Larry yeah. says, we need a Notre Dame alum, or we need an alum to do a Notre Dame Peacock endowment for all IB members. <laughs> that's good stuff. I like that. I like that. I graduated from a small state school, so I, I don't have that kind of money. <laughs> yeah, Sorry. Fine. Yeah, believe me. I <laughs> Sorry. hear that. Uh, T. Stewart, given the new NIL world, uh, do you think Kelly realizes that top wide receiver talents will just not wait two to three years to play? All I can say is I hope so. They're saying all the right things, and they are. You know, you, you want to talk about, like, why are we more optimistic that the offense is going to be more explosive this year? Because we saw some of it in the spring, and we're talking to recruit after recruit who tells us that that's what Tommy Reese and Dell Alexander are telling kids. We're going to throw the ball more. We're going to be more explosive. We're going to do this. We're going to do that, right? Um, it sounds great. Next, we just got to see if they're going to do it. You know yeah. I mean, that's that's we're, we're at that show me stage now. But Right, that's um, exactly you, right. Go read the rest of what he said, Vince. Oh, yeah. He, he said, uh, with the NIL money heavily relying on playing opportunities, do you think a lot of coaches will ultimately have to promise recruits X minutes in their first year or they will move on to a coach who will? I, I think that that's possible. I think some coaches will do yeah. that. But it, I here's here's this my is why the transfer rule was so stupid. It, it's only going to work so many times if you can't follow through with what you're promising. Because, right. look, that stuff gets out, man. Like, right. hey, coach promised me this. I didn't get it. So I'm out. You know what right. I mean? Like, you don't oversell what you can't, you know, don't, don't right. uh, write checks that you can't cash is, is, is an right. uh, uh, interesting way to put it. But um, yeah, coaches this is why they that. need to really rethink the trend. They won't because they're too stupid, but this is why the yeah. NCAA needs to rethink the transfer rule right. because of this, this right here. Uh, look, I also still think just because you're not starting doesn't mean you're not making money. Yeah, I mean, Quinn Ewers is going to make a, a snot load of money this year at Ohio state, whether he plays a snap or not. Because right. he's a big time recruit, Bryce Young has never played a meaningful snap of college football, and he's going to make high six figures, if not seven figures. It's not really about playing time. If you're a big time recruit, you're going to make money no matter what. And I, and I think that honestly, if, if anything, this helps Notre Dame differentiate between who are the guys that are in it for them and who are the guys that want to go win a championship. That's the difference. Yeah, and I think that kind of helps out with the weeding process a little bit. Because if a kid tries to say something like that to Nick Saban, you know what Nick Saban's going to tell him to do? Go to Georgia and and, and we'll enjoy beating the crap out yeah, of you. Yeah, exactly. Georgia will make those promises. Georgia yes. will tell kids anything they want to do. Yep. That's why Georgia doesn't win the way Alabama does. Georgia's had better recruiting classes, uh, rankings wise, three like what three of the last four years over Alabama. They're not they're not they're beating not them on the field. field. Not touching them, right? Yeah. Because you know, in Clemson's rarely a top five recruiting team. Right, but it's a it's the process, right? Yep. And if you if that if you're all about that, it like there was a kid, uh, there was a kid that that basically was saying a, a recruit that a lot of kids wanted that was basically saying, hey, if I'm not playing my first couple of years, I'm gonna leave. And and he said that to people, and so Notre Dame said, peace out, good luck going somewhere where you're not gonna compete for championships, right. but you're gonna start, but you're not gonna play for championships. Yeah, that's not the kind of guy you want. You're right. not gonna win with that kind of guy. Yeah. Go ahead, I go. guarantee you that Notre Dame has not made a single promise to Jalen Sneed or Josh Burnham or Tyson Ford beyond you're going to get a chance to compete. And yeah. that's always going to be Notre Dame's mantra. Now, there may be a time where it's kind of obvious that based on our depth chart and how good you are, you're going to play as a freshman. But you need to mean it. And at the end of the day, again, you don't have to be a starter to be making money on NIL. Michael Campbell has an interesting one. He says, are we still a defensive-focused team? I don't hear any juice or excitement to sell this new aggressive passing mindset spoken by Tommy Reese. I'm just hearing uh, who's not here anymore. I'm not sure about that last part, uh, to be honest. I, I'm not sure how to frame I mean, that last part. Look, I, I think after, let, let's, let's have this conversation on Sunday, right? Like Notre Dame has a chance to sign two top 100 receivers in this, this week. True. Where's, where's that momentum coming from? It's right. not, 
it's not Tommy Reese sitting there breaking down film of what they did. Like, here's a perfect example. There was a receiver on campus. He ended up committing to Florida, but he was this this worked really well. But Notre Dame sat down, and when they were watching film with him, they were not watching film of the 2020 season. They were watching practice film, and they were showing him all the stuff they're doing. Well, they're not just doing that stuff from practice film just to do it for recruiting. It's because that's what they're doing. So I, I do think there's a lot of juice or excitement. We may not be talking about it because we can't see it. Right. But they're definitely, definitely um, – selling it to recruits, which is why I think they're in a good position to have a pretty good week yep. uh, from when it comes to offensive recruiting. And again, this season will go a long way towards, I think, the excitement. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, that, that's how I feel. You well, know? they got to put their money where their mouth is. Exactly. That's going to be the big thing. That, that, that's exactly right. And I think part of the reason, Michael, there's not a lot of juice on this end is because you and me and Vince and a lot of other people are in. I don't care what you're going to have to say. I want to see it. Right. Exactly. I, I, I'm, I mean, I, and that's fair. I mean, yeah. that's totally fair. Yep. We need to see it. We need yep. to see it. That's the boat I'm in. Uh, David Knight. What's up, David? He says, uh, does Tommy Reese have the only set of keys to the Ferrari or does he share them with BK? I mean, look. It's BK's Ferrari. He just lets Tommy run it, you know, drive it. You know what right. I mean? Whereas right. in the past, he would only let Tommy ride in the passenger seat. Now Tommy gets to drive it. That's a right? great analogy, by the way. Uh, but That's it's awesome. still BK's Ferrari. Yes. Right? And I think BK, it's kind of like, you know, he's that dad that, okay, my my son's proven trustworthy enough to, to, to drive the Ferrari. Right. You know, he doesn't just get a ride in the passenger seat with me anymore. Or not it's, just a prom. Like, you can actually drive it to school every day. You definitely know not I mean? letting my kid drive it to prom. Are you nuts? Yeah, yeah. You buy a Ferrari and let Dylan drive the prom. Yeah, right. <laughs> you uh, drive in my car. He'll exactly. never get a date. Yeah. But uh I, I think we're gonna see this. I think we're gonna see Tommy to your question, David. I, I think we're gonna see a lot more of Tommy Reese's fingerprints on this offense. But I also think part of this is is what was the thing that I advocated for at the beginning of the offseason? It wasn't for Brian Kelly to not be involved and not have his philosophy. It was Brian Kelly needs to go back to who Brian Kelly was before he got to Notre Dame. Yeah. Now you can let Tommy Reese be the guy that gets you there, but it's got to be your philosophy. And and Brian Kelly's always going to have his his fingerprints on the offense. It's yeah. just more about hey, we need to be explosive, we need to be efficient, and all this kind of stuff. Score a lot more points. Tommy, get us there. You know, but it's still going to be BK's philosophy. Correct. That, that's just the way it is. And now it's up to Coach Reese to carry that out, which is what good coaches are supposed to do. Correct. I mean, Urban Meyer was always – you You were going to run a spread offense with Urban Meyer if you were running his offense. Now, it may you may have your own wrinkles on it and all that, but you were not going to come to Urban Meyer and hire, be hired to run a pro-style, you know, 12 personnel offense under center with a fullback. Right. You know, right. Uh, well, that's not 12 personnel, but you get the point, 21 yeah. personnel is what I meant to say. Point taken. You could yeah. you could be really good wherever you are, but like you're not going to coach for Urban Meyer that way. That's just not his philosophy. Now, did Ryan Day and Dan Mullen get to run the offense the way they wanted to run it? Sure, but it's with Urban's blessing and yes. DNA of what he wanted to look like. Correct. Dropping dimes, who is the punt returner? <laughs> no clue. <laughs> that's no great. clue. That was a great response, by the way. Yeah. Uh, um, all the punt returners from last year are available. And they'll have Lorenzo Styles. So I'm hoping I mean, it's Keys or Styles or Xavier Watts or something like that. I, I, that's what I hope. But yeah, that it, it, it remains to be seen. Uh, Robert uh, he goes, Vince, I agree. My 16U travel baseball player will not sit down and watch a Tigers game with me. Sad. I love sitting down watching I'm sports joking. games when I was a kid. Joking, I loved right? watching football games yeah. and baseball it, games. It's a it's those. an epidemic, and I, I I hate to use that word because of everything that's going on, you know. But it, it's an epidemic with young kids. They yeah. don't want to sit. Their attention span is so short, right? That they can't sit down and watch a three hour baseball yeah. game. Yeah, I mean, it, it. I'm it's not gonna say anything because I'm not a parent, but I mean, I just feel like you just we, at some horrible. point in time we have to push back against that. You just <laughs> have to. It, it's horrible. That's all I'm going to say. Because uh, it's not going to change when they become adults. It's, uh, exactly. You know, it, it's going to make them unproductive problem. when they become adults. It's going to make yep. them, you know, it, it, it's not It's not good. It's not good. I got a question down here, recruiting question, Vince, awesome. while you're looking. Brandon says, uh, Brian, oh, do you see a scenario where Notre Dame takes Everhart and Bradshaw? Bradshaw's mm-hmm. maybe the fourth receiver and Evan Hart as, Everhart as a second running back who could also play receiver, which is a position of need and talent buys. Uh, they're not going to take Everhart to play running back. Right, he's not a running back. Um, he plays it in high school, yes, in an option offense. But he's they're they're looking at him as a pure receiver. Do I see a scenario in which they could take both of those guys? Yes, 
I could see that, but it would have to include a decommitment, in my opinion, or them missing out on on Xavier Nwangpa and them moving Amorian Walker to safety. It would have to it would have to involve that. I don't believe they're going to bring Everhart in as a running back because he's not going to play there. It wouldn't. Right. I don't think that'd be a good move because right. he's not going to play there. So uh, could I see a scenario in which that happens? Sure. Uh, am I predicting that it'll happen? Not yet. Things, some circumstances would have to change for that to happen. I would be, I would like it. I would love to have both. You put those two guys with Williams and, and, and Merriweather, I'd be, I'd be thrilled with that. But I think it's more of, you just got to get one of those guys. You, where are you at, Vince? I am 335. Uh, Aiden Schuler actually set his commitment date, and then in an article on 247 said his parents and him are still discussing his options and where he wants to commit out of his top three, which I found unusual. It's very rare. And yeah. kids sometimes kids will say that, but people know. where. And I'm not saying this is true of Aiden Schuler. It's why I said nine out of ten times. It's very rare that a kid will do that. And when kids do do that, they, they arbitrarily – um, commit right at a time without like knowing a lot of times I get real nervous about those guys because those are the guys that end up decommitting because they right. rush into a decision that, right. you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and it's, yeah, I, I, if my kid ever has an opportunity to be picking between multiple schools and things of that nature, I'm going to be involved. Like there's some people like, Hey, it's his decision hundred percent. But if he makes a decision, it's just dumb. They're just dumb. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm going to be like, look, dude, we have to have a conversation about this. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I, I still feel like it's a child, and you know, adult supervision is not a bad thing. Right. And I don't know if that's the case here. I, I don't. I, I'm speculating 100. percent I'm just saying it, it could be something like that. Mm-hmm. You know, where the parents step and in, br- and like, yeah. Anyway, Brandon but, did answer the question that I asked earlier, yes. Vince. Yeah, I was going to pull about, that up about Walker. Uh, so, so he, you're saying, so he, what he's saying is, Brand, and Morgan Walker's part of his dream class because he's already in the class. Because he's already there. Yep, yeah, exactly. Okay. Which I, I get totally that. fair. Totally yeah. fair. Yep. If I were to do a dream article tomorrow, dream class article tomorrow, I would include every committed kid, as I said earlier. So I'm, I'm with you. I just wanted to be yeah. sure if we were on the same page on that. But yeah, <laughs> John Monty, did you read that one? At, okay, here we go. Go ahead. Oh, okay, I'm going to go this one, and then I'll look for that one. Uh, David says, uh, 18-year-old kids are hard to predict. Their heads are all over the place. It's like selecting a prom date. Yeah, I've seen that live and in person, too. Uh, that is for sure. Uh, which one did you want me to look at? I'm John sorry, Monty. Uh, you may not want to read the whole thing. You know, you can pull it up. But yeah, you may not I hear wanna... you. Yeah, I hear you. Uh, I am not happy waiting for Notre Dame home. That, that one you can say. I say that one. It's the oh, next the, two that. Yeah. Oh, the okay. I hadn't gotten yeah. that far. Okay. Yeah. You know, I'm I'm pissed off waiting for the Notre Dame home opener and NBC does this and they can um, be, kiss it, my fat behind. There you go. Thanks. Yeah. 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 But hey, Notre Dame's it. allowing it to happen. I get it. I, I mean, Notre Dame's on board with this. This isn't just NBC doing this. This is this is Notre Dame being on board. With this. I would I. That's conjecture, um, but I'm pretty confident that I'm correct on that. Wouldn't you say that's true, Vince? Mm-hmm. I would, yeah. Uh, here, here's Brandon's original dream class. Caleb Brown, Merriweather, Williams, Bradshaw. But like you said, since Walker was committed, the other three remained a strong possible option, and I would take Everhart or Bradshaw now. Mm-hmm. So there you go. Yep. John Zabrowski's got an interesting comment, Vince. You want to pull that one uh, up? Julio Jones? Yeah, mm-hmm. Uh, he says, uh, Julio Jones was the closest thing to Randy Moss we've ever seen. So I'll agree with you to one degree, the length and the speed, but Randy was such, I mean, Randy was a guy could return punts for touchdowns. I mean, he was so elusive. Julio was more of a fast, explosive vertical player. Sure. Whereas Randy could, Randy could play like a slot and he could play. I mean, he was so do anything. Yeah. He had two of those three things I would say. But there were just some things that Randy could do that even Julio couldn't do. But his point, it being the closest thing, I'd say it's probably accurate. But even then, it's just there were things that he could do that just that guys that are six four just aren't supposed to be able to do. It was just yeah. unreal. Uh, Chris Ayers says, "Is Notre Dame back recruiting Bradshaw hard?" No, they're still recruiting him the same way that they have all along. Not hard, but still recruiting him. Right. Yep. And Brandon, I guess, answered that a little ways down the way. Mm-hmm. Um, It'll be so, that's another kid who may be visiting for Toledo. I believe Quinchon Junkins is going to be visiting for that game. Well, so he'll be able to and, see the game. Uh, uh, Xavion said he's going to visit early in the season. He didn't specifically say which game it would be. 
So we'll see. <laughs> Chris. Chris says, how does ESPN rank IU one spot ahead of Notre Dame? I know IU football is on the rise, but come on. GSPN. I, it, oh, Sid Irish with the response. It's ESPN. Who cares? <laughs> Sadly, Sid, a lot of people do. Right. That's what, that's what I hate. Like a lot of people see that yeah. and just get real fired up about it. Where And I just they're a story. They can, yeah. They're a story. I mean, that, that's what it is. They, they, they do yeah. have a good coach. He gives a really good halftime and pregame speech yeah. that they put on TV. And, and, and he also does a great job getting them ready to play Monday sure. to Friday. I mean, look, yeah. if you're not prepping your team, it doesn't matter what your pregame. Th- th- those players love that guy. And that's yes. something I really respect about Indiana. They no love question. that guy. No question. They will run, literally run through a wall for that guy yep. if he asked them to. But he also does a good job of getting them prepared and getting them in a position to play. And I think losing their OC a couple years ago is going to hurt them a little bit more this year. It didn't hurt them as much. It hurt them a little bit last year because they could, you know, they didn't have a great record for all the talk about how good Indiana was last year. They didn't have a great record. But I wouldn't say they have mediocre talent. I do actually think they have some pretty good players, and especially with all the transfers that are getting. You know, I think they have pretty good players. They don't have top fifteen. At, you know, top fifteen. Right. They're, they're borderline top twenty-five talent. But they're getting ranked like a you know top ten to fifteen team, and it's it's all it's about the story, right? Like Vince, like you said, Vince, it's about the story. Yeah, and it's a good story. It's just not it, it shouldn't translate to that. That, right. like, that that's my thing. And then know? Chris Ayers also made a comment. He said he's a good coach. Talking about Tom Allen, but is he better than Kelly? No, but see, here's the problem that I have. I've seen rankings of people, and they'll, they'll rank Brian Kelly at you know, they'll they'll hinder him as well. He's going to drop him because he loses these big games. But then you don't see the same thing said about other teams that also lose or other coaches that lose those big games. It's, it's, it goes back to the whole thing of Notre Dame gets held to a different standard than everybody right. else, which I'm okay with as a Notre Dame fan saying, hey, it's ex- you know, titles are the expectations of whether or not I'm pleased or not with ultimately the job that Brian Kelly's doing. But at the same time, you can't say, well, Brian Kelly loses too many of these big games. Well, so does everybody else not named Dabo Sweeney and Nick Saban, right? I mean – you you look at Jimbo. We did that one that top coaches ranking. Jimbo Fisher's like what are they like? They like five six games under five hundred against top twenty five teams at Texas A and M in his last year at Florida State. Right, like they're not winning those games either. What's right. the big game that Mac Brown has won at North Carolina? I mean, Mac Brown hasn't won a big game since sure before Brian Kelly was even at Notre Dame. He was still at Cincinnati the last time Mac Brown won a big game. Basically, you, you know, what I mean, being a bit hyperbolic because he had a couple teams in ten and eleven that were, right. were good, but. You know, last time they were really relevant was that 09 season. So it's um Yeah. Yeah. Uh Jay Wiki Jr., I'm gonna put his post up here. He says he, he's an Iowa State fan. Yeah, alum. Uh, alum. He's an alum. Yeah. So he said that before. He used to, I believe he also used to write okay. for the student newspaper, I believe. Oh, very cool. Uh so. he goes, that ISU team was a young team and they were put in the wrong bowl, just like how Notre Dame was put in the wrong bowl against them. The hype is there due to the experience. He says now ISU is much older and a more experienced team. And that's all fine and dandy. But at the end of the day, you still need to have the talent to, to win those big games. And I just don't know if they if they're there. Yeah, that, that's my Anthony yeah. Solomon. The hype for North Carolina is another example of the media being anti Notre Dame until they need ratings. Yeah. Yes. I, I, yeah. I used to not buy the anti Notre Dame thing. I've, I have a hard time. It's kind of like I, I have to kind of almost have my head buried in the sand a little bit. Yeah. To, there's just too. It's kind of like there's just too much evidence to say otherwise. I used to not think that was accurate, but I I don't make that argument as much anymore. I don't think everything is an anti Notre Dame thing. Like every time they're critical of Notre Dame, it's not anti Notre Dame bias. But I'm more and more believing that there's more of that than I care to. I cared to recognize and accept in the fast in the past. Here's an interesting comment, Vince. John Jabrowski yeah, says, "If I'll be honest, if Peacock is the future for 1099, which is just speculation that somebody else made, You're right? I think I will cheer an SEC team instead. Got to vote with my feet so the networks know they're stupid. But the problem is, you're going to be doing the same thing to watch the SEC by that point in time. Yep, that that's the problem. It's this is just the direction that it's going to go unless people just stand up and say, nope, we're not doing do it anymore. We're we're not going to take it anymore. Right. You're, you're not going to charge me do this this and this to watch my team play. You know." Omar says, I watched some tape of Caden Fegan. He reminds me of one of those big Alabama backs from five to ten years ago. And fast, then, long strider. Yep. Yeah, and then Sid Ira says, he's fast for his size. Two questions I have, is he a running back, and how much bigger will he get? 
He's a running back now as a sophomore, rising junior, but I don't think he's going to stay as a running back. I think he's going to outgrow that position, but he is definitely – he ran a mid-4-5 at Notre Dame's camp this summer, which is moving for a six foot three, two 220-pound kid who's a rising junior in high school. That's right. moving. Yeah. And Omar asked, how, how do you guys like his tape? I liked him. I was fine with the offer. I mean, even before I found out he ran a mid four five, I was like, "Hey, this is a <laughs> this kid's getting no hype and no rankings, but this kid's got some talent." So, yeah, yeah again, like with most rising juniors, I want to see how he continues to develop. But I, I, I liked it. I liked what I saw from him. I did. <laughs> Sid said it could be two fifty. Yeah, uh, by twenty twenty three. Yeah, there's. I mean, he's already. Yeah, there's no question. Yeah. I mean, I'm not. I wouldn't predict it, but it wouldn't shock me either. Uh, and. and uh, it, it, Sid wants to know where you where where would you put him? I don't Brian know where Driscoll. I'd put him right now. I, I mean, I I want to see how he plays the next two years. It's one of those kids that this is one of the rare times that you just recruit a kid to just hey man, we'll figure it out. Because if you can stick it, if he can stick a running back, great. He can bring some value there. He could maybe be a Tommy Trumbull type of player, you know, as an H back tight end kind of guy. Maybe he plays defense. I, it's like uh, he's just a football player, and and yeah. I normally don't like that. I normally don't like. I was having this discussion on the message board about. You know, just bringing a Maureen Walker in, and but when you start getting tight on numbers, you get to the point where it's like you, you got to have an idea of who he's going to play because we still need a yeah. safety. We definitely need someone who can play safety, that kind of thing. But in, in this type of kid, and somebody said he reminds me of Anthony Barr, and that he's a jumbo athlete, and that's kind of the, the, occasionally I, I like that. And I think this is the kind of kid that I'd be more okay just saying, "Hey, look, we'll figure all that out down the mm-hmm. road." Uh, dropping dimes says, "I feel like if we had Kevin Stefferson in 2018." We would have had a great offense, but sadly he got into some trouble. Yeah, I don't think the receivers were the problem in 2018. I don't. And, and, and I, I think that, look, that offense was clicking pretty well until the playoff game. It really was. And, and I think the problem in the playoff game was the quarterback, not the receivers of the scheme. Um, I thought the receivers were pretty good. I don't think the O-line was very good that year. I thought the running game was good at times, but inconsistent. But, I, yeah. But, I, I mean, Kevin would have been really good. Don't get me wrong. I just don't know if that would have moved the needle a whole lot because they were already really good at receiver with, with Claypool and Boykin. Uh, David Knight says, Vincenzo and Brian, I have seen several pictures of Emil Wagner. He does not look like an offensive lineman. Is there possibly another position that he could play? I don't I don't think so. I don't – I've. I, I don't know if I've seen him play defensive line, and I don't know if he's he'd be he'd translate well there. But I'm with you, David. I don't. I don't see the frame either. And I don't care about a guy being thin. George Fitzpatrick, the kid that committed to Ohio State, another thin player, and it says a lot that they took a kid from Colorado that has the same sort of concern that they have Emil Wagner, who's from right down the street at a pro Ohio State high school. It says a lot about how they yeah. think he can fill that frame out. I- I'm with you on that. That's very concerning to me. Well, and here's a question by Tyler on that very subject: Is wonder if Bayless signed off on Wagner and ability to add good weight to his? I, I don't know if Notre Dame's pushing for him just yet. Yeah, yeah, and that might yeah. be yeah. I, I, again speculation by Vince uh, Delario. I, I wonder your, if that your, might your be speculation why. has some validity to it. Fair enough. A lot of talk about Ewers. Mm-hmm. Got to love that. Yes, he is enrolling early. It's all because of money, regardless mm-hmm. of what you hear. Sorry. Well, and then he tried to he tried to talk his way out of it. Like, no, it's not about that. It's about you know wanting to get there. And, and you know, no, it's no. Not. Sorry, I'm sorry. His coach put out a thing too and tried to like frame it that you know he supports him and all this other right. stuff. If I'm his coach behind closed doors, I'm, I'm pissed. Home. I'm so mad. Like, really? A week before we go into fall camp? Are you kidding me? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's it, mm. so I would be yep. so mad. Hey, can we can we stop this? Benjamin Weiss said I heard today on another podcast that Michigan Ohio Center and Sears talks to the SEC. Let's assume for a second that's true. What do you think this means for the future? The, it's not true. That, that rumor's been floating around. Ohio State's already said no. The, Ohio State and Michigan are not going to the SEC. They don't, they, they're, they're already, the Big Ten still pays teams more than any other conference. Right. And they're going to get a bigger deal the next time. They're, they're not going to the SEC. Look, here's the deal. In, in, in the world of Twitter, people can say whatever the heck they want and claim they have sources. And, they're, and it, this happens so much, it makes me sick. Because it, it drives clicks. Uh, how many people are going to subscribe, you know, going to follow this guy on Twitter now? Right, and when you don't tell say who your sources are, then then 
no one can prove you wrong. Well, hey, look, you, you, you know, I, I just I was told this and you can't prove them wrong. It's like the rumor the other day about Clemson and Florida State. Like everyone associated with the Clemson program was like, this is completely made up. This is completely false. <laughs> right. You know, but but it's ESPN still ran with it. You know, yeah, like there's right. nothing to this. But some guy on Twitter can say he heard from somebody who heard from somebody that this is going to happen. And like I said, if I could, if I repeated all the things that I've heard from sources connected to the program the last 10 years, I mean, I'd be the National Enquirer of Notre right. Dame football. It, it's right. it's insane. I mean, because people people hear it and yeah, you know, they run with it, and then what 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 actually it was turns out to be something different because it gets through enough channels that it, it's just you know yeah. But that's the thing. People look. There's a lot of clout chasers. There's a lot of fame chasers that say I could go make up a rumor about Brian Kelly today and say I heard it from a really good source, and there's no way you could prove me wrong. True. And and if it comes to find out we can prove me wrong that Brian Kelly did that, you can't prove me wrong that I didn't have that source because I, as a media person, I can protect my source. Hey, right. I have sources, right? Now I would never do that because I have I'm not a moron and an idiot who's clout chasing. <laughs> right, exactly. Right, but you I mean sold. honestly, like it, there's people that do that stuff. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. A couple comments here. Uh, Dropping dimes says I love watching sports with my dad. Sid yeah. Iris says I watched with my daughter every Saturday. Then she turned into a teen. Yeah, I, I get that too. Yeah. Believe me. Uh, OC Irish fan. I pray we have a punt returner and not a punt catcher. Agree. Where uh, are you at, Vince? I am at four oh two. Okay. Chris Ayer says it would be nice to once again get excited when the other team has to punt or kick off, like it was in the late eighties to mid nineties. Yeah, but the game, the game, that's true everywhere. I mean, there aren't a lot of teams that return punts for touchdowns anymore. Yeah, it, it's it's a di- it's a really is a different game. And that's just because of the way that teams defend. I mean, last year there I'm trying to there was in the twenties of teams that had a touchdown last year. And one of the and, and th- that includes blocked punts because like there's a team that had oh, nine punt returns. Special teams. Yeah. 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 There there were there were uh nine this Auburn had nine punt returns for eighty two yards, one was a touchdown. Akron had three tu- three three returns for minus eight yards and one was a touchdown because they count those as uh you know punt return deals. So that means Notre so, Dame had a punt return for a touchdown, right. right? Yeah. Yeah. So I mean there were There were 24 punt returns for touch actual punt returns for touchdowns last year, including blocked punts, because there was one kid who had one return for zero yards. Isaiah Foskey was tied for fourth in the nation of punt returns for touchdowns last year. <laughs> that doesn't tell you everything you need to know. That, seriously. He had, he had one punt return for 31 yards and because that a block counts as punt, right. which is stupid. It shouldn't count as a right. punt return. But so if you think about that. That, that that should tell you everything you need to know about, uh, you know, about there's just not a lot of punt returns anymore. And think about yeah. how many times punts happened last year and 24 of them resulted in touchdowns, including right. blocks. Across, it's just, it's, a, it's a know, different game. Division one college it's football. It's a different game. Yeah. yeah. SMP one five. Uh, no, SMP one five. Cause there's an exclamation point. Okay. Um, if, <laughs> If you were to guess what the starting lineup is for the O line, what would it be, and how important is it that we land Zach Rice? This is going to come across. There's going to be a lot of people are going to disagree with me on this. I understand that, but it's how I feel. And we're gonna we're gonna have to wrap up soon because we yeah. got another podcast coming up. Yeah. So uh, here in about forty yeah. minutes, but yeah. I would rather have Billy Shrout than Zach Rice. I've said this before. I think Zach Rice is a good football player, but he's overrated. And I know that he's five star and all this other kind of stuff. And and look, I'll tell you what, we released the SI 99 today and he's not in it. And I had a conversation going over the rankings last night with John Garcia. And we were going over some guys that we wanted to drop out at it and just kind of making sure we really had it right. We had about a 10 second conversation about Zach Rice. Hey, I don't think Zach Rice is a top 99 player. Me neither. Okay, cool. So let's move on to the next guy. And this is a kid that I think Notre Dame has a shot to get. So, I mean, I'd have reason to maybe push for him if, if I was that kind of person, he's just not, I would have, I would have argued with him more about Billy Shrouth than I would have about Zach Rice. Um, he played against bad competition. I know that I played in that league. Um, he bullies them, but athletically he's a little tight and stiff and I, and I think he's a guard. So it would be a great recruiting win from a ranking standpoint, but I, it's not like Bland and Blake Fisher. 
Blake Fisher is a way better high school prospect than, than Zach Rice was, in my opinion. Let's actually, Vince, let's kind of wrap up now. Yeah, that's um, what I was thinking, too. I mean, it, I, I apologize if we miss anything that was toward the end here, but it's a lot of going back and forth about ESPN and, you know, and things of that nature and the schedule and, and kind of stuff that we've already kind of covered. Um, and, mm-hmm. and that's great because we're going to be back. Yeah, <laughs> we're so, going to be back. So I'm going to go make that now. And uh, it, it, it is a hot take, but I can assure you that I'm not the only person that feels that way. And I see a thing from from uh, Matt Romero. He said a Twitter handle put out all, all its five stars uh, for the 2022 class. And Mary Rice, Zach's mom, was pretty offended at the rankings, which is so annoying, and said Coach Quinn would disagree. Well, I would hope Coach Quinn would tell him that. But Well, he's recruiting the kid. Yeah. I mean, he's not going to be like, well, you're good, but are you really that good? Like. Yeah, yes, I, I, agree I just with you look. On that. I'm, he's just he's not an elite player. It, he may yeah. end up if he is going to end up being an elite player in college, it'll be as a guard, in my opinion. Now, I could be wrong, but I just got to be honest with you about that. Yeah. I, I've said all along that Jake Taylor was the better player. I've said all along Jake Taylor is the better tackle recruit. Yep. So that's that. So anyway, thanks for joining us. We will be yeah. back with you, many of you here in about forty minutes. Yeah. For Tobias Merriweather's decision, but I got to go grab a quick bite to eat and yes. uh, and get some stuff ready for that show. So. Thanks for joining us. For Brian, for Vince, I'm Brian. Make sure you hit the like button, subscribe button, notification bell, and get ready. I'm going to have the the uh, stream, the stream yard. I'm going to get the stream yard ready, which means it'll show up on YouTube for the Tobias Merriweather announcement, which is coming at five o'clock here in the next five minutes. So make sure you look out for that. Get in the chat room and get ready to rock and roll. And Vince and I will get ourselves ready for that too. So um, I'm not going to say have a good day because we're going to talk to you all again here very, very soon.